Welcome to Proceeding Horizons, a podcast for exploring topics in astronomy and space science. Since antiquity, humans have gazed at the night sky, attempting to decipher its mysteries and find our place within it. As astronomer Edwin Hubble once remarked, the history of astronomy is a history of receding horizons. Our podcast will attempt to answer some of the biggest questions from the oldest of sciences. The mission of this podcast is to explore topics of astronomy and space exploration and share them with the community of Brownsville, Texas. Our valley is entering into the next phase of human space exploration and participating in the era of multi-messenger astronomy. We are providing a forum of discussion among people of all ages and expertise to bring awareness about our role in this next exciting era. These are Receding Horizons. I'm all good to go, I think. Awesome. Where are we going? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Can we go to the space station? I've I've always wanted to be on it. It's it's my dream. <laughs> you and I don't you know both. If, I, I don't know if I'll be able to become an astronaut by the time if it's gonna be decommissioned in what, ten years or how long? Yeah, I think the the projected plan is to go through twenty thirty. So it's unclear at the moment whether it's 2030 or well past into that but if uh i guess history tends to repeat itself so in the past station was supposed to be the station program was supposed to be done in 2020 so then they stretched it out to 2024 and then to 2030 so you never know i mean but the good thing is is uh i don't know if you guys have heard about that new axiom space station it's a commercial space station right and so it's actually supposed to be built um, using the station as a template. So they're building it at the, what they call the no to forward uh, portion of the station. So it's at the very, very front mm -hmm. and uh, they're just going to expand it. It's going to have its own power system and everything. And eventually I think they're going to have commercial or yeah, commercial astronauts. So not just people, I don't know if you guys have seen like all this stuff on Twitter, they're like raffling off like seats on mm -hmm. a dragon flight. I think people are now are going to be able to buy a seat. So that's pretty exclusive. So yeah, I think I heard a price of like $250,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. I haven't heard an exact price, but something unobtainable I, I think for me at least <laughs> actually no 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 sorry the, the two i just remember the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar price tag was for uh earth to earth travel i think that's like the, the the price they're looking at to start earth to earth travel once they have um that set up so like it'll, it'll be low orbit but technically they'll still go to space but they're not going to a space station or anything they're just going to another location on earth yeah that'll be the day Maybe our kids one day will eventually experience that as normal as air air travel, right? And that would be essentially ballistic travel, right? You're not necessarily going into orbit. Right. But I'm sure you see like the cusp of the horizon. That's amazing. Um, I think Elon Musk said that uh, the Starship will do that as well as interplanetary travel, right? Yeah, Earth to Earth. Uh, so I think it, that was the tagline. Service to Earth to Earth, uh, Moon, Mars, and beyond. Whatever beyond means. <laughs> Black holes, maybe. When you don't know, <laughs> when you don't know exactly where you're going, but you just wanted to sound cool, just add and beyond. <laughs> right. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps astronomers will find the uh, supposed black hole orbiting near the sun. And the first thing that we that humans send into a black hole will be a starship. Like maybe he'll uh, volunteer one if we ever discover one. Motivation for your observationalists out there. So, yeah, that would be super cool. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so so Richard, as a as a astronomer, I'm always curious. So I'm a giant movie nerd, uh, and I love the movie Interstellar. So what's what's your take on the the entrance to the black hole scene? I think everything up to the event horizon is fine, but everything that happens inside, so like going through a five dimensional library, I don't think that's established anywhere. Um, but funny enough, uh, if you get a black hole to spin, the singularity at the uh, center also spins, 
and there could be a stable space time in the center somewhere. So uh, plausible. Anything is possible in that flat space time. Like plausible, yes, not out of the question, just not established. But love the movie. It's one of my favorite movies, actually. Like I'm glad I, I know you're a movie buff, and I'm excited about that too. <laughs> Especially Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually I was right before this. I was in a a seminar uh, for UTRGV in the physics department, and they were actually talking about black holes. And and I, and I love that hearing somebody like we know so much. And then they get to that part and they're like, but once you get inside, physics doesn't make sense and we have no idea what's actually going on. <laughs> yeah, the um, the wormhole scene is totally legit, I guess, except for what it looks like when you're going through it. But that whole idea of a ring sweeping out and when it you look directly into a wormhole, even if you're like really far away, like if astronomers found a wormhole, you could look at it really closely with a telescope and see the other side through it like a lens. So like if it dumps out into another star system, you would see that star through the, the wormhole. So that's legit. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, the part that really blew my mind with, with the wormhole scene was when I, I think it's one of the astronauts on board says, why is it a sphere? And I was like, well, why is it a sphere? And then they, they do, I'm sure they do a, a mediocre job explaining it, but I thought it was amazing. Honestly, it's amazing because they didn't do a mediocre job. Like you're taught that it, it's a circle, but that's because it's being drawn on a two dimensional projection. In reality, you could enter it from any direction. And the crazy part about it is it's hard. What you need to do is when it's on two dimension and you're drawing, I wish I had a whiteboard uh, and you draw it and there's a, center that you go you can enter it from any direction right and there's a distance whereas when you go to three dimensions you can enter it from any direction with a new degree of freedom but and it's always technically the center then and it's always the center which is crazy you can't our minds cannot perceive that jump in dimension for the center because it's infinitely inward and then you come out from any direction so we can't unravel it to one higher dimension, but yeah, that's totally legit. Like I love that scene too. Yeah. Honestly, I hate that concept so much. No, but that's one <laughs> thing that, that we keep coming back to the whole, there is no center. The one thing that, that I still can't wrap my mind around is the, the big bang. I found out like not recently anymore, maybe like last year, but that, that, you know, I assumed the big bang was at one point and then it, everything came out from there, but no, there is no center. I thought that every, you could, rewind time and, and come to this one point in space in some galaxy or just some location but no there is no center it's everywhere and so what <laughs> yeah that definitely boggles the mind i think yeah and i know we, we could we always come back to the big bang and it's like that that also boggles we always i think this is like the third episode we've used this analogy um like at the big bang there it it doesn't make sense to us to say there was no before. And yet that seems to be the fact is that everything leads back to a point and there doesn't seem to be a point before that. They're just after which was. So there was like a day where there was no yesterday and that's just a fact and we don't know how to explain that. Yeah, yeah. that's definitely unique. Yeah, there's that video and I think the way it explains this is like, when was it? Never. Where was it? Nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so since, since you brought up uh, movies and being a cinema buff, I, I, I mean, this is definitely a point I wanted to get to eventually, but uh, I, I think it's worth bringing up now. But both of you, I think uh, Star Wars was a very big part of your life and getting interested in, in space. And so that's something that guys... Uh, Sure, and I think that that's really cool. So I'll start off by saying, what do you think of, you know, since we're talking about physics concepts and Star Wars, uh, what do you think about hyperspeed? I am definitely open to the idea and I can't wait till it's real, if it is possibly to be, if it's possible to be real. Uh, that's definitely out of my realm of understanding, I guess. Um, physics, I would say mechanical physics is definitely not my uh, strength. I always struggled with that portion of it. Um, although I guess you could argue particle physics or electron physics, which is electricity is mechanical physics, but 
I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> but I love the way they depict it, uh, definitely. And the one problem I guess I would have with it is in the most recent sequels in that, what was it? Was it The Last Jedi? Where uh, was her name General Holdo? She just like hi, she just did a yeet into the all the other <laughs> opposing <laughs> uh, star destroyers, which was definitely a new thing, which I didn't know could happen. But I don't I don't want to be that I don't want to be that guy. I'm just super excited that you're a Star Wars guy. Um, <laughs> it's like meeting I don't know. It's a great meeting yeah. in 1980. There was a comic that came out that I think it was filling the gaps between A New Hope and Empire, where it was like an early comic from like the 80s. And a, an A-Wing uh, went into hyperspace through a Super Star Destroyer's uh, bridge, taking the whole ship out. So they, they did that before, but it's super obscured. It's never been shown. Um, but that, that, yeah, like that, that's so cool to see. I, I think all the hair on my body stood up at once when I saw that in the theater. Like, <laughs> I, I can definitely resonate with that. That, that, something to that effect happened to me as well. It was great. Yeah. So, did you guys watch that in 3D or by any chance? Uh, no, you, did you see it in 3D? <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually, so I make it a point to where all these movies that are just like iconic for me, I have to watch them in 3D and IMAX. And so the very first movie I did that for was Avengers. And uh, ever since then, I was hooked. And that was actually the very first IMAX movie I ever saw. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's the return or the last Jedi as well. It's the opening scene, right? As the trailers taper off and the camera pans to the stars the Star Destroyer just like blows you in the face <laughs> with, <laughs> with the nose of its ship. It's, it's super cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like, is it like, it's a whole lot better than just a normal movie experience, right? Like this sounds it's, like w immersive almost. It's definitely immersive. Uh, better. I guess it depends. Some folks can't, uh, don't like the 3d. I guess some folks that need glasses and all that stuff. Uh, but I think it's definitely more immersive. It, it adds that uh, unique depth to it, which is, it's, it adds more to the movie, which I think is interesting. It's nice. Well, technically it, that's what it adds the the depth, right? Yeah. Literally <laughs> and figuratively. Wow. <laughs> Another Bring dimension, that. literally adding Bring depth to the movie. That's, <laughs> uh, that's man. I, I miss going to movies. You're talking about IMAX and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, in the, the previews where, where like the right before the movie where it has to show you how amazing the sound system is and just like everything full blast. And I think there was one scene with like a unicorn and just to show you all the, the colors and just to, just to show off the technology before you watch the movie. Those are always special, I right? I love those. That. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're going to be really good because they, uh, they're, they show that. I think that kind of stuff really, um, I love because it's so parallel to, you know, like film, video, media, um, and seeing how it's progressed through time. Like that's all digital. The way that we can do that now versus not long ago, historically, it was like done on chemical exposures and it was put through a reel. Uh, and now we're watching three dimensional movies in time. Like that's, can you imagine going back a hundred years ago and showing like bring, bring that just IMAX theater back in time and have people go see <laughs> Avengers in 3D. <laughs> You're a wizard. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Oh, it's funny you bring up uh, film. So my, my new job involves a lot of the film uh, and a lot of restoration and conversion of film to new updated formats. And so just hearing some of the, the struggles that some of the folks that I work with now went through during the Apollo program and space lab and shuttle converting all that film is, is pretty crazy. And I actually got to, to see, well, step inside the vault where they have the original Apollo 11 film in cases in, in cold storage, so to speak. It's pretty unique. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I have a picture here. I can show you guys. It's on my phone. I yeah, don't, I don't know how much, 
so it's i've always found it kind of funny and this is totally like raw and uncut so i'm not i'm not gonna like i guess filter what i'm about to say but uh <laughs> it, it's always unique to where i ask you know some of my coworkers are just like hey can you take a picture of me right and sometimes sometimes my coworkers are just like yeah no we really shouldn't and sometimes they're like yeah let's do it and oddly enough we're in the vault where this original apollo 11 film is stored and i go hey can you take my picture and my lead was just like yeah let's let's take your picture stand right there i think my eyes are closed in it and i'm trying to find it here but here it is let's see if, how well you can see that wow so it wow. it's kind of uh what is it um uh, how do i not necessarily unassuming, but I don't know if you can read that there. It's got like, uh, those are the cases and they're all marked with Apollo 8. I see Apollo. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's just a giant fridge with all these boxes never to be opened again. And the whole thing was like, do not touch. And I was just like, well, I can put a finger on it, right? And they were just like, yeah, you, you can put your finger on it. Maybe so, don't touch the film directly, but. Yeah. <laughs> How, okay, two look, questions. How cold is it and how much data is there, like roughly? How would you uh, say? So I don't know the answer to the second one in terms of a digital data, right? How much digital data? I wouldn't know that. I would imagine it's on the order of definitely terabytes, um, maybe even a total petabyte, which is an, an insane amount of, of digital storage. But uh, the the temperature, they have to keep it at close to, as close to zero degrees Celsius as possible. So it's about 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's amazing. Yeah. I love how you, you, you just like, you push the limits. It's like, can you take a picture? No. Okay, but can I touch it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> just a little bit closer. Hey man, you, you gotta ask, cause sometimes you'll leave stuff on the table and it's, it's because you didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just go home looking at your phone. Like I could have had an image of that on there. (laughs) So since we're going into that, we, I think we did the, usually we start the podcast, um, but we just start recording and then, and then we have a certain intro format. I think we, this is, we, we jumped right into some great conversation, but uh, Richard, do you want to, do you want to go through the format that, that we usually do and, and kick off the, talk that way too yes when i was a boy i had a strange recurring daydream i saw myself confined to a small space barely big enough to lie down in curled up on the floor i knew that i would be there for a long time i couldn't leave but i didn't mind i had the feeling i had everything i needed something about that small space the sense that i was doing something challenging just by living there was appealing to me i felt i was where i belonged One night when I was five, my parents shook Mark and me awake and hustled us down to the living room to watch a blurry gray image on TV, which they explained was men walking on the moon. I remember hearing the staticky voice of Neil Armstrong and trying to make sense of the outrageous claim that he was visiting the glowing disk in the New Jersey summer sky I could see out our window. Watching the moon landing left me with a strange recurring nightmare. I dreamed I was preparing to launch on a rocket to the moon. But rather than being secured safely in a seat inside, I was instead strapped across the pointy end of the rocket, my back against its nose cone, facing straight up at the heavens. The moon loomed over me, its giant craters threatening, as I waded through the countdown. I knew I couldn't possibly survive the moment of ignition. Every time I had this dream, I woke up, sweating and terrified, just before the engines burned uh, their fire into the sky. As a kid, I took all the risks I could, not because I was foolhardy, but because everything else was boring. I threw myself off things, crawled under things, took dares from other boys, skated and and slid and swam and capsized, sometimes tempting death. Mark and I climbed up drain pipes starting when we were six, waving back down at our parents from roofs two or three stories up. Attempting something difficult was the only way to live. If you were doing something safe, something you already knew could be done, you were wasting time. I found it bewildering that some people my age could just sit still, breathing and blinking for entire school days, that they could resist the urge to run outside, to take off exploring, to do something new, to take risks. What went through their heads 
What could they learn in a classroom that could even approach the feeling of flying down a hill out of, a control, out of control on a bike? I was a terrible student, always staring out windows or looking at the clock, waiting for class to be over. My teachers scolded, then chastised, then finally some of them ignored me. My parents, a cop and a secretary, tried unsuccessfully to discipline my brother and me. Neither of us listened. We were on our own much of the time after school while our parents were still at work and on weekend mornings when our parents were sleeping off a hangover. We were free to do what we liked and what we liked was to take risks. During my high school years, for the first time I found something I was good at that adults approved of. I worked as an emergency medical technician. When I took the EMT classes, I discovered that I had the patience to sit down and study. I started as a volunteer and in a few years worked my way up to a full-time job. I rode in an ambulance all night, never knowing what I would face next. Gunshot wounds, heart attacks, broken bones. Once I delivered a baby in a public housing project, the mother in a rancid bed with old unwashed sheets, a single naked light bulb swinging overhead, dirty dishes piled in the sink. The heart pounding feeling of walking into a potentially dangerous situation and having to depend on my wits was intoxicating. I was dealing with life and death situations, not boring and to me pointless classroom subjects. In the morning, I often drove home and went to sleep instead of going to school. I managed to graduate from high school in the bottom half of my class. I went to the only college I was accepted to, which was a different college than the one I had meant to apply to. Such were my powers of concentration. There I had no more interest in schoolwork than I'd had in high school, and I was also getting too old to jump off for th of things for fun. Partying took the place of physical risk, but it wasn't as satisfying. When asked by adults, I said I wanted to be a doctor. I'd signed up for pre-med classes, but was failing them in my first semester. I knew I was just marking time until I'd be told I would have to do something else, and I had no idea what that would be. One day I walked into the campus bookstore to buy snacks, and a display caught my eye. The letters on the book's cover seemed to streak into the future with unstoppable speed. The right stuff. I wasn't much of a reader. Whenever I was assigned to read a book for school, I would barely flip through it hopelessly bored. Sometimes I'd look at the cliff notes and remember enough of what I read to pass a test on the book, sometimes not. I had not read many books by choice in my entire life, but this book somehow drew me to it. I picked up a copy and its first sentences dropped me into the stench of a smoky field at the Naval Air Station in Jacksonville, Florida, where a young test pilot had just been killed and burned beyond recognition. He had crashed his airplane into a tree, which knocked his head to pieces like a melon. The scene captured my attention like nothing else I had ever read. Something about this was deeply familiar, though I couldn't say what. I bought the book and lay on my unmade dorm room bed reading it for the rest of the day, heart pounding. Tom Wolfe's hyperactive looping sentences ringing in my head. I was captivated by the description of the Navy test pilots, young hotshots catapulting off aircraft carriers, testing unstable airplanes, drinking hard, and generally moving through the world like exceptional badasses. The idea here in the all-enclosing fraternity seemed to be that a man should have the ability to go up in a hurtling piece of machinery and put his hide on the line, and then have the moxie, the reflexes, the experience, the coolness to pull it back in the last yawning moment, and then to go up again the next day and the next day and every next day, even if the series should prove infinite, and ultimately in its best expression, to do so in a cause that means something to thousands, to a people, to a nation, to humanity, to God. This wasn't just an exciting adventure story. This was something more like a life plan. These young men flying jets in the Navy did a real job that existed too. These were hard jobs to get, I understood, but some people did get them. It could be done. What drew me to these Navy pilots wasn't the idea of the right stuff, a special quality these few brave men had. It was the idea of doing something immensely difficult, risking your life for it, and surviving. It was like a night run in the ambulance, but at the speed of sound. The adults around me who encouraged me to become a doctor thought I liked being an EMT because I liked ta ta taking people's blood pressure measurements, stabilizing broken bones, and helping people. But what I craved about the ambulance was the excitement, the difficulty, the unknown, the risk. Here, in a book, I found something I thought I would never find, an ambition. I closed the book late that night, a different person. 
I would be asked many times over the following decades what the beginning of my career as an astronaut was, and I would talk about seeing the moon landing as a kid or seeing the first shuttle launch. These answers were to some extent true. I never told the story about an 18-year-old boy in a tiny stuffy dorm room and followed by swirling sentences describing long dead pilots. This was the real beginning. That's part of the prologue of Scott Kelly's Endurance, A Year in Space, A Lifetime of Discovery. And that was recommended by Alex. Thank you, Alex, for that. I'm gonna read the whole book now. <laughs> well, thank you for reading that extra. Uh, I think that was, ex that was an excellent choice. And uh, it really, I don't know, it just like draws inspiration, I think. Great words by Scott Kelly. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce the episode now. So welcome to Receding Horizons. On today's episode, we have Emmanuel Zamora, or Alex, as his friends call him. Alex is currently an electrical engineer working at NASA's Johnson Space Center as a civil servant for NASA. He was born and raised in the great city of Brownsville, graduated from Hannah High School, same as me, and received a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Texas at San Antonio. His experience as an electrical engineer includes an internship at the Brownsville Public Utilities Board, a job at CPS Energy, and then landing an opportunity as a subcontractor for NASA on the International Space Station program where he provided engineering support for the space station's electrical power system, or EPS, more specifically for the Spartan Flight Controller at Mission Control at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Alex recently stepped into his new role as a NASA civil servant in January of this year, 2021, where he oversees and implements policies over numerous programs. His long-term goal is to become a flight director. On a more personal note, I've known Alex for many years, since middle school and then high school uh, through band, where he played saxophone and I played the trumpet. <laughs> we didn't really become close friends, though, until just uh, a, a few years ago when I met up with Alex uh, at his parents' restaurant here in Brownsville. It was called Zamoras. It is now called Los Gallos. Shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> to me, Alex and Richard are two of the greatest examples of how the curiosity and curiosity in space and the universe can bring people together as friends. And so it goes without saying that I'm really excited about this episode and to talk about the International Space Station and space exploration. So thank you for being here, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. That was a great intro. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm excited to be here as well. Um, I really any chance I get to really talk about a lot of the stuff uh, that goes on ar around me, I try to take advantage of it. So thank you for giving me this opportunity again. And I'm really excited to read, uh, to meet Richard for the very first time and pick his brain a little bit. Uh, it's Likewise. it's going to be a really, <laughs> thank you. It's going to be a really interesting conversation, I think. As well as you, Victor, but I pick your brain all the time. So. Yeah. Yeah. This is great because, you know, uh, Richard is a physicist and you are an engineer and there is so many ways that the two can work together for achieving some some of humankind's greatest achievements and so uh, yeah I'm excited to talk about it absolutely yeah we've already kind of opened it up with Star Wars <laughs> which will which will continuously come back to <laughs> yes Tune in yeah. later for a breakdown on every single movie. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're going to go through each scene. <laughs> Don't tempt me with a good time. I was going to say, can we, can we make that happen? <laughs> yeah, the three of us can do like commentary over the movie and people can watch it with us. The there will be a separate set. podcast created. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can go into expanded universe and all the other stuff. <laughs> That'll be fun. That's, you know, the, the expanded universe is something I never really got into. I, although I will yeah. say, I, I remember going into the public library and looking at the books, but never actually reading them. Okay. <laughs> start, you should start with the Thrawn trilogy. The original Thrawn trilogy. Thrawn? Yeah, like, you know, Admiral Thrawn? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 
like I think he he's now in some of the newer stuff. I think it's either Rebels or uh, Clone Wars, but uh, he was originally a lot. I think he was a lot different and a lot better. And they encountered him five years after Return of the Jedi, and he basically like brings the Empire back. Ooh. So those three books are like that. You, that's like the next uh, trilogy, essentially. Gotcha. So, mm-hmm. so what you're saying is that should have been the sequel. It could have been that, or it could have been what I would have preferred was Dark Empire, which was um, a three-part graphic novel, and it's read like a, it's really read like a book, even though it's a graphic novel, and it's about the Emperor coming back, and he has to go from clone body to clone body to survive, and he's trying to find the next host to survive and that just so happens to be Han and Leia have a their youngest son is Anakin and I'm pretty sure he's trying to take Anakin's body just like kind of like the emperor in what is it the uh um the rise of Skywalker he comes back kind of as a clone and he's trying to find a strong force body to use so it does parallel that a lot that's it's close that's awesome I didn't know that was actually a thing. I thought they just kind of threw ideas at a wall and whatever stuck they went with. So no, it was it was legit. But they, I think, the last Jedi was went in a direction a lot of people didn't expect, and that's fine because it it did. But um, the stuff that they showed, especially in Rise of Skywalker, that really did parallel the Dark Empire. Like Luke Skywalker turns to the dark side to get close to the Emperor in Dark Empire, and then there's mm. a big fight between them. It's pretty crazy. Like. Yeah. That sounds really rad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So just uh just like for my my awareness, is is there like a like a bullet by bullet format that we do or is it just like Nope. Is it just freehand? It's freehand. Yeah. Okay. Um yeah. we have I have like um a bunch of stuff about the ISS and also like uh the talking points that Victor uh, sent uh, basically in front of me, so we can go by that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if it's okay, I, I want to start uh, by asking you a little bit more about your. I think it's very relevant to the the book excerpt that Richard read as well. You know, the the way that the really interesting way that um, Scott Kelly kind of found that path for himself. Uh, can you talk a little bit about? your path to NASA? Okay, sure. Um, so, uh, sorry, you might see my dog here every now and then. He's very needy. Um, yeah, so starting off from the very beginning, so um, similar to the excerpt that was read, you know, I found myself to not necessarily be the best high school student. Um, I really enjoyed music and everything like that, but I was never really into academics. Um, And similar to Scott Kelly, I never, I didn't get accepted into the school that I wanted to go to, which was UTSA originally. So I started off at community college. And from there, you know, a lot of folks have that inspirational one teacher that makes everything click. And so for me, it happened to be my pre-calculus teacher. So he was the one that really tied mathematics to reality because before then it was just numbers and letters right um and once he did that it it clicked in my mind and and i thought man this is doable you know i i can do this and so at the time i was studying computer science i wasn't studying uh, engineering um but contrast to understanding math go figure i couldn't understand programming uh programming was something that was really difficult i was actually failing a couple of my classes. And so I decided to jump ship from programming, not because I couldn't do it, but more so because I felt like there was some, to me, a degree should be something you enjoy and it shouldn't, it should come natural, right? You shouldn't have to like, you know, they say work is work, but you should always also enjoy what you do. I think that's, that's what helps you get up in the morning and everything like that. And so Um, I've always liked breaking stuff down (laughs) and putting it back together. And half of the time it didn't go back together the why the way it was originally intended to be, um, from the very beginning. But, um, so I think engineering was a, a right choice for me. Um, I went and talked to one of my advisors and at that point I managed to get into UTSA. So the first semester I went to UTSA, 
um, I met some really, really, really cool professors, one of which is actually from the Valley. He's from, I want to say it's Westlaco. His name is Dr. Lars Hansen, a uh, really amazing guy. Um, he is a walking encyclopedia. It's now in hindsight, I think about it. I'm like, oh my God, this man had so much knowledge. And, you know, at the time you're just focused on passing classes, right? You don't really think about, I guess you don't really see what's in front of you type of deal. Um, you're so jaded by the, the schooling. Um, but yeah, um, engineering made a lot of sense and I actually managed to get some pretty good grades, albeit not with a few failures. I did have one class that really, uh, that I really struggled with, but, um, after that, everything kind of settled out into what I like to call my steady state. Um, the last bit of my schooling, right? The real engineering actually made a lot of sense. And so after that, um, I decided to study for some licensing programs here in Texas. So there's a, a professional engineering degree license that you, or professionals engineer, professional engineering license that you can work towards too. And to do that, you have to take a series of tests. Um, think about it like a CPA, right? Like a, an accountant that gets certified to become a certified public accountant. It's kind of that for engineers. And so I did that and I had heard about that when I did my internship at uh, Brownsville PUB. And so once I uh, did my internship, passed those tests, uh, I landed a job in San Antonio. And due to some personal reasons, I actually needed to find a job in Houston because I was finding myself commuting to Houston every other week. And uh, I didn't have that much time off as I wanted to, uh, to spend time with my family over here in Houston. So I started looking and I applied everywhere and I actually got a few interviews and um, this interview for the company that I worked for uh, supporting ISS uh, was a, sub a subcontract for, uh, for NASA. The, the company is called SNK Global Solutions. And um, I, I had an interview with them and then got hired on and just hit the ground running. Um, everything from getting up to speed, not so much with the system and everything, but just acclimating to the culture um, that is NASA. It's, it's something that's definitely unique. Um, I definitely uh, em embody it now, but it was very difficult. And it was, uh, there was a lot of growing pains. It was uh, the challenge I want to say of my life um, so far, I guess. Right, that's the idea, right? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Could you describe the culture of NASA? Like, what do you mean by that? Um, if I could just put it in one word, I would say it's intense. Uh, and that should go without saying, right? Um, the, the level of intensity that, the, that everybody there has is, is um, inspiring. It's... Um, it's a level of intensity that is that I have always craved, but never found until I wound up here. Um, the level of integrity there is is amazing, and I think that's truly difficult to find, uh, especially in the, some of the previous work experiences that I had. And um, just the it for me, it was more just I wanted to be like these people if that makes any sense. And so I remember sitting at a, at a conference room table and listening to some of these folks talk and I thought, Oh my God, you know, these guys are, they're rock stars, you know, they're rock stars. I want to be, I want to be them. I want to be like you. And so I tried my absolute hardest every day to, to get up to speed and to do that. Um, but it's funny uh, if, if I may, uh, while we're on that topic, I don't know if you guys uh, have, have ever seen that documentary that's on Netflix. It's about um, the, I want to say it's the Challenger. Yeah, the Challenger um, uh, accident. I, yeah, I, I saw, um, I think I saw a couple episodes, but I, I, not the whole okay. thing. Okay, yeah. Well, there's this one part. Um, there's a, uh, he's an astronaut. His name is Greg. His last name is, uh, eludes me, but Greg uh had a so obviously he was an astro one of the astronauts that lost his lives in that um uh, incident but he his wife talks about a story where he when he got selected to become an astronaut 
he thought, you know, how am I going to be as good as they are? You know, like I'm just this one guy from this one place, you know, I, I don't almost like, I'd feel like I don't have what it takes. And, and, uh, he thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to stand in the back of the line and I'm going to watch these guys do it. And then I'm going to slowly and slowly build up my, uh, my experience, right. To, to be what these guys can be. And so I thought that was a really great way to put it. Um, and had I watched that before I started working, I probably would have made less mistakes. So I did the total opposite. Um, I thought the best way to to make myself be known is to put myself in front of the line. And I happened to trip a lot. And because of that, I made a lot of mistakes and I fell on my face a lot of times, but I got back up. And I think uh, I, if I hadn't done that, I don't think I would have learned as much as I did in the amount of short amount of time that I did. Yeah. And that's like a consequence of, uh, working in a new environment that's so intense with inspiring people. It's, um, especially when you have the background that you do, you've had, have you, have you always been interested in at least like, like space exploration and, um, it's like the meeting your heroes. You want to, you want to go as quickly as possible. Uh, I totally understand. That's totally understandable. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've always loved, um, you know, human, the human aspect of, of space flight and, uh, I remember being young and watching the shuttles launch on the news and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it's, that's the, that's how I describe it to the most folks It's meeting my heroes. I feel like I definitely uh, am experiencing that to this day. So it's, it's unique. That's awesome. I think there's a lot there about, yeah. Um, I mean, with everything, right. It's like, do you, it's great to have people to, to model off of and to kind of understand that the directions that they went and, and, you know, learn from, from their mistakes. Um, but also try to try to stick out and do it your own way and, and learn that way. I think there's definitely a, a, a balance that that's not easy to find in any situation. Yeah. Definitely agree with that. And so then, then, so, okay, you're, where where were you along in the story? Because I, I don't think you're done yet, right? There's still more. Oh, is there? Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to. I want to. I want to talk about your like role with the ISS. Because oh, okay. Like, but I mean, I don't want to like rush it. If you had, I wanted to hear how you got to that point. Yeah, I mean that's a really good segue. So with this new job. Um, well, no, I guess let's start with my very first uh, NASA job. So with them, uh, we worked in a, in a building called, well, Mission Control, obviously. And uh, there was a room called the Mission Evaluation Room, or the MER, as we like to call it. And so everybody at NASA talks in acronyms. And it's, it's, uh, it's really cool when you get up to speed because you, you, know, you feel real cool, right? You're, you're in the know. But when you're on the outside looking in, it's... Uh, like everyone's talking in code and uh it's it's definitely difficult those aren't words (laughs) (laughs) i know right and then sometimes they extract acronyms out of things that's just like yeah that doesn't really fit but let's roll with it uh so it's really it's really fun and everybody's really really fun there too so that also adds to the the experience but yeah so working in the mer um the mer serves as engineering support for the flight control room so it's the flight controllers that are actually operating the vehicle right so the vehicle being the space station and eventually future programs so orion and all that stuff and uh, well we recently talked about axiom right the axiom space station so that's actually a private uh space station that uh i imagine will have its own set of flight controllers outside of Johnson Space Center, uh, just because it's not a NASA project, but maybe they'll be adjacent to each other. I'm not too sure. So it's definitely something that I uh, am keeping my eye on because I think, uh, I don't know, I like to think of the space station as my baby, uh, as weird as that sounds. And I was only with it for a very short time. Um, But man, it was, it's, 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 it's oddly unique. So I don't have any children, but um, it's like this weird 
uh, intimate moment where you have to spend all day and all night working on, on this one thing that just really makes it yours. And it like gives you ownership in a really interesting way that I've never felt before. So it, it's almost, you know, like you're building something and you're just like, it's so difficult. And there's times where you just want to just walk away from it, but you don't and you persevere through it. And at the end, it's just so satisfying. It's that same feeling. But um, anyways, that was a bit of a uh, digressing. But yeah, uh, so Richard, <laughs> uh, sorry, I keep uh, veering away from the point. Yeah, so working in the MER was really cool. Um, every morning, we had to provide support to the uh, Spartan flight controller. So they, Spartan is a really unique console. Um, they operate the electrical power system as well as the external thermal uh, control system. So they call that the ATCS, which is the active thermal control system. And then the electrical power system, they call it EPS, right? Which is electrical power system. So um, in the, uh, during station assembly, those two consoles were their own consoles. It used to be Falcon and Thor of all, remember I told you unique acronyms, right? And uh, when station was complete, they merged the two consoles and they made Spartan. And so the console that I manned, uh, we were called Phoenix. And so buckle up, it's a long acronym, okay? So it's, uh, here, I have it here, just so I don't get it wrong. It's power hardware operation, electrical networks and illumination experts. And so, yeah. We, <laughs> Expert. <laughs> yeah, we took the X out of experts for the, the ending of Phoenix. So it was really cool. Um, yeah, and so I was lucky enough to inherit the battery uh, project. So when I had first started, um, there, there was a project going on to replace the on-orbit batteries of the EPS system from nickel hydrogen to lithium ions. And so at the time, there was only 12 lithium ions installed. And I would like to say uh, that I was uh, instrumental in the installation of the remaining batteries. So all in all, in total, there is uh, 24 lithium ion batteries installed now. So I was there for about half of them. And those are new, right? You were there for, for the replacement of those. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so what was really cool is as engineering support, right, we had to uh, support Spartan. We, we didn't do any of the commanding, so to speak. Um, but what we did do was plan all of the operations, right, how we were going to shut things down, um, transfer power over to other channels, and keep everything running seamlessly, right? And so if you look uh, behind on, on Victor's bookcase there on the station, you know, each one of those solar arrays, those big wings, uh, those each, each solar array pair is what we call a channel. So there's eight pairs there. So there's eight channels. And uh, on, each, on each channel, uh, it used to be that there were uh, six nickel hydrogen batteries and we were replacing them with lithium ion batteries. And so the, the developer, builder, designer, uh, was actually my mentor uh, during this whole process. And so he was a, a very special guy. I, I, he, he will always have a special place in, in my mind and in my heart, um, as, as weird as that sounds. Uh, um, but yeah, so we had to design, we, we work with a lot of disciplines, right? Obviously, um, there was some missions that you could robotically remove and replace the batteries, uh, but there was some missions where the robotic arm wasn't long enough. So it had to be EVA only. So the crew had to go out the door and take the batteries out and all that stuff. So everything was broken up into disciplines. We majority of everything we did was focusing on the electrical side, um, which was definitely challenging because we experienced a few problems along the way. And so that's kind of what I meant about earlier when we talked about how there was some days where it was just day in and day out. There was some 12 plus hour days and, six or seven uh, days a week, uh, weeks. So it, it was definitely unique and it, 
it was really, really fun. It's one of those things where I know in the moment, if you were to ask me, I probably would say I wasn't having a really good time, but now in hindsight, I'm so, I'm so glad I was be, uh, able to be a part of that as well as not just for the experience, but for sharing that with uh, the people that I did. So, so how did the, the mission go? The batteries are designed and then they're uh, shipped up essentially. And then astronauts have to go and take them out and install them. And you're guiding them through this process. Kind of, sort of. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm actually wearing the shirt, uh, shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> so I, got to work with uh, some of the folks that uh, actually installed the batteries onto what they call the external pallet uh, or the exposed pallet. I'm not sure, but we, we call it EP, right, for short. And uh, there is, um, it's launched out of Tanagashima, Japan. So the, the Japanese uh, Space Exploration Agency, they actually, um, we ship the batteries to them and they charge them there at their facility. They install them into the vehicle and then they launch them up and the vehicle that arrives to station looks kind of like this is just like a giant cylinder um, on launch. It looks like this guy right here. I know it's kind of hard to see, but pointy end up flaming end down. Right. Um, yeah. And so when it gets there, uh, the vehicle is what they call it's birthed. So it can't autonomously uh, dock to the station. So what happens is the station, the vehicle does a series of rendezvous maneuvers to uh, get to the station and the robotic arm on the station captures it and installs it on one of the birthing ports. And so what happens after that is the robotic arm can actually extract the pallet and install it in a location on the station for stowage. And so depending on if the mission, depending on what truss we were installing, right? So you have, uh, we, we think of the vehicle as a vessel, right? Like a, a nautical vessel. So we have, we designate, you know, the left to port, the right to starboard. Uh, we have obviously uh, Zenith and Nader, and then we have forward and aft, right? Um, and so the, the truss segment uh, is starboard and port. And so what we do is we have different, the channels are on different parts of the truss. So we have like, for example, we have S6, S4, right? P4, P6. And um, at a, on each truss segment, there's two channels. So for every mission, we outfit one section of the truss, which is two channels. And depending on where it is on station, it's either ro robotically accessible or has to be EVA only. So uh, we don't actually create the plans for what the crew does. There's a different console for that. Um, but the thing that's also really cool is we have to shut down that channel completely, right? Because uh, there's a lot of safety that goes into all of these missions and we have to keep the crew safe. That's the number one uh, requirement, right? Uh, keep the crew safe. So we have to have all these different levels of safety features implemented into the channel. So we shut down certain things. So I'll give you an example, right? Uh, it's kind of, it's going to be kind of funny. So, I don't know how much you guys know about electricity, but it's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, thinking about just like home electricity. So if you're gonna unplug your phone charger from the wall, you have to go to the uh, to the panel in your garage or wherever it is in your house. You have to shut that breaker off. And then you have to go to the light pole and shut the transformer off at the light pole. And then you can unplug the charger. So that's like the level of safety that we go through so that um, the crew is safe. And so the real hazard is molten metal, right? So if there's some sort of electrical short circuit anywhere, think about it, right? You're free floating. And so if molten metal comes out and God forbid it snags a suit, you know, that that's it. So that's definitely something we definitely uh, achieved, right? I can say we achieved that level of safety, but what I wanted to get to was because we have to shut down these channels, um, we also have to keep the habitable volume pressurized and everything operating as expected, right? So there's still crew inside that has to be maintained alive. And uh, so we have to keep all of those systems operating 
And so in order to do that, uh, there's different teams that allocate, you know, this is how we can keep the vehicle in power balance. And this is how we're going to point the arrays um, to generate uh, as much electricity as we can. And if there, if the forecasts, you know, were to come back unfavorable, um, there's what they call power downs. So some payloads that are, that are some science, I guess, right. That's there operating, that's consuming electricity sometimes have to, has to be shut down. And that's not always favorable because the station is, is almost being rented, right? So uh, space on the station, time on station is really, really expensive. So to do that, you know, some of the folks that paid millions of dollars to get their science, you know, worked for this many hours, it had to be shut down for, you know, eight hours at a time while we do all this stuff. So it was definitely a challenge. And what was the motivation to switch from nickel hydrogen to, to lithium ion? I mean, for those people who are listening who don't even, I mean, lithium ions are in your phones, but um, like, what's the motivation to switch? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I always just assume people, people know, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so nickel hydrogen technology is a pretty dated technology. So um, lithium ion technology is obviously a, newer more robust technology and the biggest driving factor for replacing it is um, the the chemistry within the nickel hydrogen batteries degrades over time as do the tech, the capacity of all batteries right so a good example of that is if you have your phone and you keep it for around two years or so uh, at the very beginning you notice wow my phone lasts me all day and then at the end of two years, you're just kind of like, man, my phone doesn't even make it through lunch. So it's, it's kind of that same thing, right? To where batteries have a certain amount of uh, capacity and think about it like a bucket, right? You put as many electrons in the bucket as you can. And the, the technology is designed to where uh, it degrades over time and eventually you can't get all of the electrons that you put in out. And so, it's just newer technology, I guess. Uh, yeah. Newer, cooler, better. Yeah, How better, harder, the... faster, stronger. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice reference. How long are these batteries supposed to last now, now that they're fully installed? Uh, so these new batteries are expected to last to the end of the program. Uh, so anywhere between 10 to 15 years. Um, and those suckers have a lot of energy. They were really, really beefy batteries and so you know uh i don't know if you guys caught it but at the very beginning i mentioned that each channel had um six nickel hydrogen batteries and there was three lithium ion replacing them so that means for every two nickel hydrogen batteries that were originally installed one lithium ion is taking its place so that's how much energy um i think the proper term is energy density right? Uh, the lithium ion batteries are way more energy dense than nickel hydrogen batteries. And how big it would, are they? Like, like, how, like, are they bigger than a human? <laughs> uh, they're, I mean, they're, they're pretty big batteries. They're about five feet by five feet uh, in, you know, uh, perimeter uh, by three feet. So they're, they're pretty big and they weigh about 450 pounds each. So what would like two astronauts have to go out? How many people would have to go out when they would have to go out? So normally two astronauts go out uh, every single time. There's only been a few EVAs where there's been three astronauts that go out, but that was more during uh, the assembly of station. Um, and when we had the sh uh, capability of the shuttle. Hmm. Um, but the beauty about uh, microgravity is, you know, they weigh 425 pounds on, on earth, but microgravity they're, you just nudge it and it'll tech, it, it'll keep going forever, right? That's what Newton tells us. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Victor, did you have a? I I, yeah, I think I interrupted you at the beginning there. I, I had a question about batteries, but I, I think it was about batteries, but I don't remember them. But now I'm thinking <laughs> about EVAs and and that yeah. just I don't know, like that, that must be an amazing feeling, huh? And and how you were talking about the possibility of. Uh, and damaging the suit and something catastrophic happening. I mean, NASA does everything to they can to 
to prevent that. But even just the, the thought of, of that being in space, I mean, yeah, the battery could, could go on forever. So could an astronaut. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the aspect of human in space flight is to me the most unique thing. And so with EVAs, that's one of the dangerous things the astronauts can do aside from launch. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the, the EVA suit is, is its own spacecraft, uh, in essence, right. It has to maintain pressure, oxygen, right. And it all has to be, there's no cables attached to it, right. It's not tethered to anything. It's not plugged into a wall. Uh, and that, that's the part that's amazing. Um, I guess that's not entirely true. It is tethered to station so that in case they lose their grip, they don't float away. But, but uh, in, in the event they do, they actually have a really cool um, contingency safety mechanism called SAFER. And uh, that's an acronym as well. And I couldn't tell you what that stands for, although I could look it up. Um, but uh, SAFER is just a, a basically a jet pack. And so it's, um, it's on their backpack and they hit a, um, like a little door on their right um, it's right next to a right leg and like a joystick comes out and they basically place it on their, uh, they, it's called the mini workstation. So it's on their chest and they could basically just, you know, float to the station and retether or, you know, get to safety, get to the airlock at some point. So it's really cool. So this, this part right here is called the, the mini workstation. So they could like do stuff on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they actually, I'm going to scoot back a little bit here. So they have these like little, little arms like these little think about it like a tripod right um uh, or one of these I, I, i've got it for my phone it's kind of like one of these you know where it's just like these like movable things and it's got little little hooks on them and so you could basically you know put your your phone on it right or whatever i don't know yeah so it's, it's called the mini workstation oh so a selfie stick <laughs> yeah so basically. every astronaut has two selfie sticks and they're like <laughs> yeah so it, it's really unique they they've uh they've done all sorts of crazy stuff um i don't know if you guys have ever you know looked up photos or anything like that of the suits um but the one thing i find really really special about the suits it's all the wording is is backwards and do you guys know why that is? It, it has to do with, with uh, reflection, but I, I don't know specifically. Yeah, you, you got it. You're right there. So <laughs> uh, the, the crew members um, on their suits, they have these mirrors attached to their, their wrists. And so if they, if they need to adjust, because they've got like dials, kind of like uh, Darth Vader, right? He's got his little, little suit uh, control panel thing. They can adjust mm -hmm. uh, for pressure, for temperature, right? Because... Think about it, right? They're outside in the extreme heat and extreme cold in insulation and eclipse. So they actually wear this undergarment that runs liquid through um, the garment to keep them cool. And then they also have a, a temperature regulator, which keeps them warm. And so they can adjust it to whatever they like. And so <laughs> it's really cool during the, um, during the checkout, um, both crew members go into the airlock. And so they, they get shoved into the airlock and one goes in head first and one goes in feet first. And the one that goes in head first comes out first. So he's on the part of the airlock where the door to the exterior of the station is. And they step through the checklist, right? And in the checklist is just like, okay, go full hot, go full cold. And once they check out that the system's good, um, obviously all this has telemetry, right? So ground controllers on the ground can verify that they see the same thing. Um, they say, okay, we'll take, take the temperature to whatever you think is best or to your liking. I, I forget the proper term they use, but they get to adjust it. But yeah, it, it, the, the suit is really unique. And there's a, there's a plate that comes down, right? For the, the helmet. Yeah. Their, their solar visor is, is really cool too. Um, it's really cool set of, of sunglasses, <laughs> arguably the coolest set of sunglasses. Just, just. Right yeah <laughs> yeah and they even have um you, they even have these uh little plates to where if the sun so they have the regular clear visor and then they have the the uh, solar shade 
And then they even have these two little white pieces that can go next to it to kind of minimize your field of view. And the suits that you can really see that in is in the Apollo uh, suits. So they actually use that uh, quite a bit. And I guess fun fact, the, the EVA suits that they use in Apollo are the same uh, suits we use now on station. So not, wow. not the same ones, right? I guess I should really clear, clarify that. It's the same design. It's not the same exact suit that, you know, one of the astronauts was in. They're passed down. Yeah. This one smells <laughs> like Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ultimate hand-me-downs. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, they have a, uh, do they have a suit there at, at the uh, Johnson Space Center? Yeah, they've got quite a bit. Um, so there's this building um, in Johnson Space Center. It's called Building 9. And uh, it's one of the buildings that you can actually take a tour on when you go to uh, Space Center Houston. And so they have a catwalk. I, I just, sorry, I, I'm so sorry. I just want to say I love how, like, all the other acronyms. you got Spartan, Phoenix, Thor, and then you were, like, you were built, it, all, it was almost like a build up to the building. They got this building it's called Building 9. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's like a whole like university campus. So there has to be some sort of way to to designate it all, right? It would be cool if there's no building one through eight or above nine. There's just a building nine. That would, that would be good. <laughs> yeah, so in building nine, they have the, uh, the mock-up uh, of the station. So they actually have a physical mock-up of the habitable volume without the truss. And uh, I've actually been lucky enough to be able to go on the floor a few times and uh yeah they they have uh obviously they're for training right for ground training um but yeah they've they got full full suits i think uh i've sent y'all a picture uh of yeah next to one of them remember oh yeah that's right yeah that's yeah I, I think I, I used it for the the blog yeah. yeah yeah that's right that was the coolest picture i've taken then <laughs> <laughs> notable achievement right yeah it's funny because the suit is empty, right? There's nothing in it. Um, but I like when I, I was the first one to be just like, oh, I'm going to go take a picture with this, with this astronaut suit. And then I picked up his hand to be like, I was shaking it. And literally after I did, everybody started doing it. So I was just like, oh no, did I just like screw something up? No, you're, normally tra- you're setting trends over there. That's what's <laughs> happening. You're first with data. Now <laughs> Yeah, with the like you're 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 real you're pushing it farther than other people realize. You're like, oh, can we touch it? And they're like, I guess there's no rule against that. And then with the astronaut, like you picked it up, and somebody else was like, you could do that. Yeah. Somebody in the distance was like, you could do that. <laughs> I'm gonna do that. <laughs> you're you're known as that guy that pushes the limits. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing to be known for. <laughs> I'm sure, I guess it I'm could sure go it, either way, right? It could go either, either way. I think it fits in NASA, though, pushing limits for sure. Yeah. It's wow. like, that's what we do here, guys. What What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Got to be creative with it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You're, you're unknowingly, like, creating a, a, a newer culture of NASA. <laughs> <laughs> There's people off in the distance that are like, man, he's at it again. Yeah. <laughs> There's, like, beware signs with my picture on it. Beware of this guy. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was like mesmerized trying to imagine all of the, the scenarios of being in space as you were describing like the, the procedure to like leave, for instance, to do an EVA. Um, were, how, how closely did you, um, how closely tied were you, for instance, with like their daily lives, like on board the station? Like, was there a lot of overlap with that? Did you, um, like for instance, when you were redistributing the power system, so for for the power system, we try to make it as uh, minimally invasive as possible for the crew, just because their time is so precious up there. Um, but obviously, if there, you know, all of these payloads require electricity. So if there came a time where it was, you know, this rack is malfunctioning, um, let's let's troubleshoot it, and it came down to being like, oh, it's the electric on it. You know, we would work directly with a lot of the engineers on the ground and we would help develop procedures uh, for the crew. So every, that, that's a, the thing I really like about NASA. I'm, 
I don't know if it's, I, I hate saying like, oh, I'm an engineer, right? But the thing for me is just like, you tell me to jump, I'm going to jump. Or, you know, you tell me to drive 10 miles an hour, I'll drive 10 miles an hour, right? Uh, and so we just develop these procedures and we tabletop all these scenarios. So it, it's really, really cool. Um, and I'm a kind of person that hates planning, ironically, but this is like on another level. So we would develop procedures and there's all these really, really cool um, aspects to that. And if I may, I'll, I'll tell you guys a little story. It's pretty cool. And this, this has to do with the astronauts safety as well as like their daily lives. Right. Um, so on, on board, right. Uh, you have to have a uh, constantly flowing air. Cause if you really think about it, if there's no fans on board, uh, the air doesn't move. There's no uh, dynamic changes in pressure that causes any wind or anything like that. So you have to have constant fan uh, spinning to change the, or to have airflow. And so what'll happen is if the crew decides to go back behind a rack uh, to troubleshoot something, um, there could be a point to where they uh, produce so much carbon dioxide that they create like a little bubble of carbon dioxide. And because, you know, the fans aren't, they're not behind there, right? They're just in the regular volume of, uh, of, the, of the cabin, but they're in like a really unique, you know, crawl space behind a rack. And so they have to, they have to come in and out of the rack really frequently. And I don't know if you guys have ever, you know, worked on any, anything that's just like, I just need to get this done like yesterday, right? having to stop and then start and then stop and then start is like the most frustrating thing. Um, but yeah, I found that to be really unique. And one of my really, uh, really close, uh, coworkers, uh, in my previous job, he, he was what they called a, a day one -er. he's been there since day one, um, for the design of station and everything like that. Uh, yeah, he, he told me a lot of really, really interesting stories and that, and that was one of them. Um, you know, how they have to like refresh them in and out. Right. Um, and then they have to even take some fans in there sometimes to move the carbon dioxide out to get the machines to recycle all that stuff. So it's pretty interesting. And there's just no, no way to fix that. Or is that there's just not enough, uh, focus right now on that. There's other uh, stuff that you have to focus on, like, or that's just a little quirk essentially of the job that you just have to get used to. And that's just the way it's looked at. So I think the, the intent is, uh, because the crew is not there all the time, there's no need to implement a solution. So it's just kind of like, we have a workaround, right? Like we'll have you start and stop kind of deal. It's effective. Yeah. It adheres to the 80% rule. The 80% rule. Which one's that one? I don't know. I always make up a different percentage each time, but <laughs> <laughs> it's the two thirds over pi rule. Or nice. <laughs> you get eighty yeah. percent of it done, and then no, I don't know. I can you can you explain it a little bit more? I kind of get the the gist of it, but I always learn something new anyways um about the you know specifically the electrical power system and and you know um obviously there's there's solar arrays on the international space station so how um I know that's an, an automatic process of of switching the the gears in terms of power, but can you talk a little bit about about that whole system and and maybe even it's some some history and yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so the the station electrical system was designed to parallel the electrical systems here on Earth, um, just obviously tailored to space. And so um, here on Earth, right, we have, you know, these pl uh, power plants that generate electricity um, through steam turbines, right? So um, they have a water boiler that boils water, creates steam, and they send that steam through turbines to turn a, a generator and output electricity. That's sent to a transformer, right? And that transformer distributes electricity to a substation, and then the substation gets to the power pole and then to your house. Simple, right? Uh, <laughs> and so 
station is, is a lot like that, right? So we have our generators are the solar arrays, right? And from there, um, well, the unique challenge with station is, you know, the station orbits every uh, 90 minutes. And so we have this hour period of uh, insulation, which the solar arrays produce electricity. And then we have this 30 minutes of eclipse. Um, and that that number 90 minutes is not constant, right? Um, depending on the seasons, um, where we are in the year, uh, those times change. Uh, it it gets to the point uh, where there is no insulate or no eclipse. So the sun shines on the station 24 hours a day. And so that's a really challenging uh, portion just for, you know, thermal, uh, thermal limits, right? If the sun's constantly beating down on you, um, something's got to give sometimes. So we, the engineers on the ground try to do the best they can to mitigate those uh, impacts. But um, so, yeah, so regarding the power, uh, power system, so the electrical, the electricity gets generated through the solar rays and it gets sent down to some switch gear and that switch gear uh, does two things. So it, it directs power to the habitable volume as well as charge the batteries in that insulation period. And so um, we have all sorts of different switch gear, uh, different uh, converters, right? Uh, which step down uh, voltage. And uh, we have um, basically, they're almost like uh, power strips, right? Um, where you can plug stuff into. Um, so it's it's not vastly different from you know, the systems we have here on Earth, uh, it's just tailored uh, to things in space. Um, but the one thing that is drastically different is the type of electricity that we use on, on orbit. So because we have to store energy, uh, we, we use batteries. So batteries output DC electricity. So everything, and as well as solar panels generate DC electricity as well, right? Um, the, the system I described to you guys earlier about the generator and the transformers, those are all AC systems. So that's, those are the two uh, different, um, I guess the, the things that differentiate Earth systems from space systems. Uh, so I'm sure Edison would be really happy. <laughs> As you guys know, right, it, it's kind of ironic. Um, I, I hate to, to cut, cut into the chase, but it's kind of ironic that uh, Teslas are named Teslas because uh, Tesla was actually a AC guy and not a battery guy. Right. I find that fine, uh, fairly ironic. That's interesting. But it's a clever name. I will say that. Yeah. I wonder how many times that's been brought up. I haven't actually, I didn't think of it that way um, until you said that. Yeah. Yeah, Edison was all about DC and right. killing elephants and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Among other things. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just I just made that real bad. That's good. <laughs> we we uh, Victor and I were talking about being more, you know, just saying more or less what we want on yeah. the podcast. First few episodes are we're we're not sure what we're allowed to do, but that's what. You know what? You're a good person to have on then, because we're trying to see, like, ooh, can I touch this? Essentially, right? You know? Yeah. NASA style. NASA yeah. Style, that's right. Would you say that you're pushing the boundaries? <laughs> if we're not, then we're doing something wrong. <laughs> the potential title for the podcast. Oh. That's actually one. That's actually one uh, thing that we do is every episode where we basically just on the fly come up with what the title's going to be. So. If you hear any candidates, you know, don't keep it to yourself. Gotcha. I There's like that one though. There was something at the at the very beginning before we did the intros that uh, I think Alex said did something about the the edge of the horizon or something with horizon in it. But that might be a little repetitive because the name of the podcast is already receding horizon. <laughs> Could be that pushing the boundary or uh, yeeting into a star destroyer. I think I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was my favorite one i think so far i like that one yeah <laughs> it's funny because that that word is so weird like for me and so i try to use it as like unequivocally as as i can right. whenever it just doesn't fit 
but does at the same time, throw it in there. I was going to say, because I I'd never was quite clear what the precise definition of to yeet means. Like, I just hear it in similar context that you described. So. I always thought it was like throwing stuff. I no, always get the sense that. of like moving fast or like kind of getting, getting <laughs> yeah, out Yeah, you're, of you're throwing like, yourself somewhere. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that is what they did in the movie. Yeah. They yeet it to death. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> always gets to death. Admiral Holdo, the queen of yeet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So dumb. <laughs> the, final, the final yeet saved us all. <laughs> A new yeet. I'll get all the names. <laughs> Episode 10, yeah. The return of the yeet. The return of the yeet. Get all the Star Wars names. <laughs> Attack of the yeet. Yeah, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> the, the yeet wars. <laughs> no. Oh no. I'm editing this part out. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> I'm totally okay if it stays at school. It's funny too because when I do like the uh the timestamps, it's usually something serious like ISS power system, you know, e- EVAs, yeeting. <laughs> like You gotta have the comic relief. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's the great. last he the heat strikes back. The phantom yeet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> uh, okay, let me let me bring it back. Uh, okay, not just kidding. We don't have to. We don't have to bring anything back. But we're talking about Star Wars. We talked about the the motion that we're adding phonetics to, um, and then so they went into light speed. So the ISS also goes very fast. I think it does. I heard it like I heard I watched a video right before this, but and said it in kilometers, but I think it was it's what sixteen thousand five hundred miles per hour. You're close. Seventeen thousand. Seventeen thousand. Yeah. Okay. And so that's a really unique number. Um because in a sense well, I guess um uh, you bring up a really good point because I, I actually thought about this the other day. Um you know, we always talk about the crew is like in microgravity. And, uh, you know, they float here, they float there, they float around. Um, they here, they heat there. There you go, yeah. <laughs> they're, in, they're in low yeet orbit or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're really just falling. You know, that's what creates that unique environment. And so that 17,500 miles an hour is due to our Earth's gravity. So if if you were to go any faster, your orbit would increase. And if you were to go any slower, your orbit would decrease. And I guess you would eventually burn up uh, in the atmosphere, right? So. Right. And and if you if you could somehow hold yourself at that distance without moving, you would feel ninety percent of the gravity that you would feel here. So you it it actually gravity at the at the altitude of the space station, the gravitational force is only ninety percent. It's actually still pretty close. But the fact that they're falling continuously, that's so I always thought that was crazy because you think like, oh, there's it's zero gravity, but there's actually quite a bit of gravity there. It's just that they're falling, as you said. So, right. Um, yeah, that's always an important distinction that I was told. I, I remember seeing seeing that for the first time a while ago. And um, it took me a while to think like, yeah, that's true. They're moving really fast, too, at the same time. So. So then is is the space station so so then there is a component where where it's being flown and it's being directed and then it's also using earth's gravity to kind of stay where it's at does that is that right uh it's so you're you're on the right track right um so basically you know as i mentioned earlier the station is falling and so um we like to think that there's you know we're in a complete vacuum. There's no sense of friction, right? Um, And I I guess to touch on another thing I mentioned earlier is, you know, if we threw the the battery out into space, it would keep going uh, forever because Newton tells us that. I wanted to throw in that word, but I'm not, but I'm not going (laughs) to. What word? Uh, (laughs) The phonetic word. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But uh, yeah, so if there's some sort of friction, right? A tie, uh, to the station. And so in a sense, it's slowing down. 
um, every time. So as you slow down, your orbit decreases. So there is a, a period. I want to, I don't know how frequent it is. I want to say it's like every month or every other month. Um, but the, the very aft portion of the station um, is the Russian segment. And so in the Russian segment, the very first module that flew was called the service module. And the service module, and they, they give it a proper name. I want to say it's Zarya, but don't quote me on that one. I'm not too sure about the the name. Also, like when you see like EVAs and stuff, or like you'll see some NASA publication, it's like, oh, we installed this onto the Harmony module or the the Hope module. It's like, I, I couldn't tell you what module that is, but if you tell it to me and what, you know, like we don't really use that terminology, I guess, on the inside, but but they do for all the publications, which is a little strange. Um, but anyways, I digress. Um, yeah, so in the service module, they actually have uh, propulsion boosters on it. And so every now and then they'll, they'll, they'll perf perform what they call a reboost. And so it'll just uh, elevate its orbit or go faster, right, uh, to keep it in the proper orbit. Yeah, so then 17,000 like, miles per hour is like the goal and when it starts to get lower and the speed decreases under that enough they provide that boost to kind of get it back. That's exactly right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, from my understanding it's like a one or two meter per second boost to get, get yourself like a kilometer up more or so. That's right. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's these really interesting videos on YouTube. Um, so on station, they have these massive cameras, like they're, the lenses are super big. I don't think they're even this big, but that's just, that's what fits in the frame. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're massive. And so this one astronaut uh, was in inside the, the vessel and he put the camera just letting it float. And as they performed the reboost, the camera started moving. Right. And that's, that's a artifact of the reboost and how it affects the in internal volume of the station. So it, they do feel it, but it's, it's something relatively negligible, right? Cause you, uh, Richard, you mentioned it was a couple of kilometers. Uh, I forget the, the unit of measurement you use, but. Yeah. Like if you're going, if you're going in like a kind of circular orbit and you want to extend your orbit out a little bit more, you give yourself a positive boost in velocity. So, it's like a meter per second more this way gives you a kilometer boost out. Like right. That's, that's something like that. Right. Yeah. So in a sense, the faster you go, the further away from earth you orbit. Yeah, exactly. And like, and, and I don't know if uh, for those who might be watching um, it's like, if you're in a circular orbit and you're at this point and you burn, what happens to the orbit is the orbit goes like this. And then you stop burning and then this stops getting bigger and that's your orbit. And then when you get to here, if you want to circularize it, you burn this way and then, then your orbit circularizes out. So you have to like burn uh, or burn backward to deorbit, right? So, right. So, so is the orbit of the station um, generally more spherical or oval? shaped it's pretty spherical uh or circular i guess um circular yeah 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 it's pretty circular and they try to keep it as constant as possible so if the earth were fixed um it would pass over the same spots every single 90 minutes um, but due to the earth orbiting or revolving right due to the earth revolving um you know we sometimes see it in, in brownsville we sometimes see it in houston and fun fact, I always, every, um, there, there's this, uh, meteorologist here in Houston that I really enjoy. Uh, he's actually really, really cool. And I guess that's kind of weird now saying that cause I follow a meteorologist, but he'll always post, uh, when the ISS flies overhead. And so I'll always share that. Yeah. Hey, you know, Tim Smith is popular over here. So <laughs> Tim Smith is Meteor. my guy, man. I love yeah. that guy meteorologists have i yeah. think i've had this discussion with richard too there's something about have we about meteorologists that so. they're just like popular <laughs> they're yeah. like they okay. can't do like how could you be you, they're just the good guys like locally like hey it's gonna rain you should prepare hey thanks 
<laughs> you, know, you, you know, like everybody in like ancient times would go to like the oracle who would say like, oh, Zeus is angry, so there's going to be a storm or an eclipse. And they're like the modern versions of that. They're like, well, according to our models, you're going to have a tornado in two days or whatever, you know. Yeah. And we're like, oh, awesome. Thank you, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, what does the computer say? What does it tell us? <laughs> Yeah, but you, you brought up, so you brought up the, there's actually a, there's a service called Spot the Station uh, that actually will let you know when the station's going to fly overhead. And it's so cool how it tells you like, oh, it's going to be over the city. It's going to be there for, you're going to see it for six minutes and it's going to come from the Southwest and, and uh, go across to the East or something. And so, so you go out and watch it every time you get that. Every time I, I have the opportunity to, I definitely do. Um, it's one of those things where it's extremely humbling and the feeling that I get whenever I see it, it's just like, I can't even put it into words. Um, yeah. It, it, if, especially if I'm having like a really hard day that day, um, seeing it always just like picks me back up. So that's awesome. Yeah. It's really unique. Yeah. Whenever I'm out at the observatory here at TTU and I I don't know exactly when it's going to be over, but when you see it, you know, immediately like, Oh, that's the ISS. Yeah. And I'm sure you have like such a, um, such a unique feeling having worked on it. I, I'm sure similar when I see it, uh, I, I'm like, there's people on that right now and it's moving so fast. Like from here, you could see, you could tell how fast that thing's moving. There's just people on it. Like it's crazy. Definitely. Yeah. I think they say it's one of, it's the brightest object in the sky when it's, when it's passing overhead. Um, yeah. And uh, the, the, hu I, I keep throwing this out there. The human aspect of all of this is just, that's the part that's really unique, uh, special for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thinking about, wow, there's, there's six people on, on board. There's three people on board. There's I think soon there's going to be 11 people on board. So that's pretty crazy. How soon is that going to be? Uh, I think with the next um, the next Soyuz that goes up, they're taking three other uh, two cosmonauts and one astronaut, and then SpaceX's Dragon. I think it's Crew Three already. Sheesh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be Crew. No, it's crew two. It's crew two. I think it's is it crew two. No. Yeah, because I have a shirt, and it's got a dragon on it, and I remember the slogan is like <laughs> "one for all and all for one" or something like that, and that's crew one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also confusing because they, they have so they have expeditions, right? So every how, how would you describe an expedition? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, so an expedition is it revolves around a set of crew members, and so there's a little bit of history behind it because this whole idea of an expedition, I want to say was developed around when the shuttle and the Soyuz would dock to the station. And when the shuttle program was retired in 2013, uh, the only way we could get crew members on board was through the Soyuz. And so when an expedition begins is when a Soyuz undocks. So there's always that handover where there's overlapping crew, right? So for example, you'll have Expedition 64 and Expedition 65 crew members on board, but the Expedition 64 crew members are scheduled to leave once they're complete of their tasks. So depending on what vehicle they got there on, they have to leave it, leave with it. So whether that be a Soyuz or now a SpaceX Dragon, uh, whenever they, I've, I have a feeling that, that that's the way it's going to be, right? So right now it's crew one. Uh, when I want to say maybe when uh, this Soyuz leaves, um, that's when uh, Expedition 65 will begin. And so that, that, that astronaut, on, there's two cosmonauts and one astronaut on that mission. And I forget her name. Shannon? No, she's a SpaceX crew member. Yeah, I'd have to look her up, uh, but she she's really she's really cool uh, astronaut. Let me see if I can look her up. Was it Anne McLean? No. No, she was she was actually one of the astronauts that was on the expedition when I first started.
Kate Rubens. Kate Rubens is her name. So she's up there with Sergey and Sergey. <laughs> Sergey and Sergey. Yeah. Ah, oh, that must be so confusing. <laughs> I think that was that was them trolling. They were like, hey, this would be funny. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find the Russians actually really, really uh, special because they incorporate a lot of history with their launches and stuff like that. So, um, you know, they they have uh, actually this is, I think, a pretty good segue because I do want to talk a little bit about the SpaceX stuff going on down there. Um, but they they have a place called Star City. Uh, it's in I want to say it's pretty close to Moscow. and um, the crew always has to go there for different uh, when they launch out of the Soyuz and um, they do a lot of things like they go visit Yuri Gagarin's grave, uh, which was the first uh, human in space. And then they make the trek out to um, Kazakhstan where they launch. So I, I don't know. I'm a real big geek when it comes to like all that sappy stuff, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. They do that really well. Um, yeah. They adhere to tradition, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. But we get yeah. really cool patches, so... Yeah, exactly. Dude, the patches are just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so what about the SpaceX um, developments excite you the most? Yeah, so I just want to start off by saying all of them. Uh, <laughs> SpaceX is like a very, very unique company in to which I love their, I love the way they cater towards innovation. Um, they're a force to be reckoned with, I think, when it comes to innovation and, and production as a, as a whole. And so it's really, really inspiring. And it's, it's really, it's setting the bar to which what can be done. And I think that's very special and, and just, it's it's a statement of humanity in and of itself i think um and to to think it's in our backyard is i i still can't believe it you know um but with that being said i was really disappointed with the latest launch uh not because it exploded um mostly because it was done under fog and i didn't i wasn't able to see it <laughs> yeah that one um that's funny i was actually i was outside uh, I was right outside my my door, and I, I was I, I didn't have uh, my phone or anything. And then I uh, I heard it. I had no idea they were gonna do it that early. And then I heard it like right after eight o'clock, and uh, right after eight a.m. And then I I got on on Twitter and I saw I, I was I, I I it was familiar. I've seen uh, I've seen the the previous three. I've actually gone to to witness them. Uh, and, th and this was the first one I didn't. But it's also funny because even the people there. Like nobody witnessed it. Absolutely, you, no matter how close, the closest person to it did not see it because of how much fog there was. Right. So even and even with the camera, it uh, it it got stuck. So a lot of uncertainty with that flight. Yeah, I'm almost interested to know, and I guess we'll never know at this point. But had it been a clear day, would things have uh, developed differently? Yeah, because this is the first time we've heard of them having comm issues. I think that's why they decided to pull the red switch, right? Yeah, that that I, I'm not sure if it was confirmed, but I, that that was I think a huge speculation that there's a, a basically a self destruct system, and that it, it did that. It, it did not touch land. Right. It flew up in the air. So, like, at what point of the of the flight did it explode? I think it was already coming down. It, it was, was down. yeah. So, so it usually takes six minutes. Six minutes after uh, t minus zero to about six minutes and ten seconds or fifteen seconds to to uh, touch ground. Um, you know, whichever way it does that. And I think at five minutes and like forty-five to fifty seconds, the um, the camera got stuck and went blank. So around then, so it was only about probably about 15 to 20 seconds before it um, should have touched ground. 
I'm not sure how, how high it, it should be around then, but yeah, it, hmm. towards the, the end of the, yeah. Of the test. It's pretty remarkable though. Right. And you mentioned calm issues, possible calm issues. Yeah. So I was actually watching the live stream as it happened. And, uh, all of a sudden, I forget the T plus what time, but at a certain time, the video just went static. Um, it went still. And so mm. oh, okay. I, I would attribute that to a loss of calm. And then the yeah, fact yeah, that it, it, it blew up midair, it's never done that before. So I would like to think that they have that on lock, right? And most, if not all, you know, quote unquote, ballistic vehicles have a, red button to where you know if we if we don't know where it's at like um, yeah like like it's an automatic or is it manually triggered where somebody's like we got like send the command because we lost control like trigger the detonation i would think definitely it has to be autonomous because if your loss of calm how do you get it up yeah, I think it's it's called TFS, I think, but I, I don't remember what it stands. I think it might, I might be wrong on that. Don't quote me on that. But it, it was, a, there's a, it basically a self-destruct. Yeah, I think it's FTS, so Flight Termination System. Flight, there you go. Yeah, yeah, FTS, not TFS. Flight Termination System. They also call, I love the way that SpaceX calls it a RUD, a R-U-D, a Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly. <laughs> I actually had to urban dictionary that. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> yeah. It's always an interesting that. day where you have to urban dictionary stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but no, they they have done some some pretty amazing things here and it, it's crazy to see. You know, they started like in 2015. That's when they broke ground and then the the first few years were were a little bit slow and then in 2019 they started picking it up with the with the star hopper and things started happening and then over the last year or so that yeah the i mean everybody's heard of brownsville and boca chica and and starship and the things they're doing here are, are pretty crazy and yeah the the level of productivity and um i i also i i i think so that that was sn11 and for, from what I've heard, they, they're jumping all the way to 15. That's the, the next one. And it's because, um, I guess, 12 through 14 got scrapped because of uh, design improvements that they made directly to 15. So, um, and, and that's kind of, that iterative process is kind of the, the, the result of, of that productivity that, that you're mentioning. And so it's, it's really interesting that they're literally just, they skip from 11 to 15. So in a way, I... Um, would have been cool to see SN11 land, but I think they, it, it's not a huge failure. <laughs> I thought SN11 was going to be the one. <laughs> yeah. Did you see that there was memes of uh, like Star Hopper? Cause you know, the Star Hopper is right there on right by the launch pad uh, acting as sort of a monument. They also put lights on it. So it looks really cool because it looks like it has eyes and it's looking at the launch pad. And there was memes where Starhopper could talk. It's saying like, "Please don't leave me. Like I can't handle this anymore." And there's one where he he has like two images of starships, and one says like SN nine S or SN eight nine and ten, and he's like, "Please don't don't leave me." Yeah. Oh my god, that's adorable. Yeah. Yeah, and the protection of that was everybody's concern too. When when SN eleven. Uh, self-destructed a lot of people were like okay but is star hopper okay and it was yeah yeah as long as as long as star hopper doesn't get hurt in the process mm -hmm. that's all we care about <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so richard do you play guitar i see some guitars behind you yeah there's a there's an electric an acoustic and a bass nice how about you yourself? Do you play an instrument? Uh, I, oh wait, that's right. Yeah, you played in in school, right, with Victor? Yeah, I used to play the saxophone. Um, ever since high school, I haven't played, um, but I do play a little bit of guitar. I can't say I'm any good at it, but I know Victor plays guitar as well. Yeah, I, I, I it had been a while since I had actually played last night uh, for more than I have 
uh, most of the year, I think, most of this year under quarantine. Um, so I haven't been playing as much as I'd, I'd like to, but yeah. Yeah, it, it's the one. It's the one thing I like to do some at some point, kind of every day, just to like decompress, even if it's just ten, fifteen minutes. But you know, I try to get my daily dosage in. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Now the goal is, you know, Chris Hadfield <laughs> playing that's, guitar that's why on I'm the space station. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Hadfield is like one of the coolest astronauts. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's he's awesome. He and yeah. he's so I follow him on Twitter, and he's also uh, he he just has a lot of cool commentary about uh, Starship too, and it, it's just it's cool to see because you know he's a he's a he's a Canadian, and uh, it's cool to see something like that um, bring a lot of people together. I think space exploration has a has a way of doing that. I, I definitely felt that uh, it's it's kind of it's a cool story that I'm sure you know a lot of other people shared, but um we, we, it's been a, a year now that you know COVID has kind of put a lot of people on on um lockdown and away from the the life that everybody was living before but i think it was in in may of last year when crew one happened and that was it just it was so cool to know that so many people i'm not going to say a number because i don't remember but just to know that a, a huge chunk of the people in the world were watching this event together. We're watching uh, this, this, it was a huge event, right? SpaceX is the, the um, first commercial flight <laughs> and uh, they did it. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to know how everybody um, drops what they're doing to watch these events. It's like, we're, yeah we're so tied to the this idea of exploration of the unknown we feel it in our in our bones and and everybody around the world like pauses for a moment to watch like oh here's here's a new thing here's a new here's a new breach into the unknown right yeah you know in the excerpt you read um scott kelly mentions that he uh picked up the book the right stuff and so that actually was a they they remade that recently on Disney Plus, and it was actually a really really good series. Um, but this one portion that I'm probably going to butcher it um, because John Glenn had such a he spoke so eloquently, right? Um, so forgive me for everybody who's who knows what I'm about to say, but there's this uh, this really unique and uh, special idea when it comes to space exploration, right? And it's it's romanticized in such a way that just resonates with everybody. And so I I've always found that to be really interesting, and that's part of the reason that the human element of of spaceflight really uh, captures me is that it everybody, whether you know it or not we all have this inert desire to explore and learn and do things that we don't know what they are. And I, I find that to be really beautiful. Wherever that came from, I'm, I'm glad we have that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sure it came out of survival. Um, <laughs> no, a long no, time, yeah. oh, right. A long time ago it was, Oh, this is what I know. This is what I don't know. And what I don't know can kill me. And we have to be fixated on that. And yeah. so I think it's something like that. Yeah. One of my favorite books, well, anything Carl Sagan writes, right? But it, it took me a little while to read it. But yeah, it's Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space. Uh, and I think, uh, I think there, there was an, expert, an excerpt that you read um, in a previous episode from, from this book. But in, in the beginning... He, he does he talks about that how it's a natural human tendency to to wander i think one of the chapters it was called wanderers and he talked about how yeah for for survival you know we wandered across the earth and we populated and now the whole earth is populated and we all we came from from one place on the earth and then spread out and now humans are everywhere on earth and so it's a natural tendency to 
to grow that and to expand that and to, you know, what the next frontier is uh, space and the moon and Mars. And so it's, uh, it's, it's in our evolution. It's in our, it's just humanity. Yeah. It's, it's fair enough to say that it's in our DNA to, to seek um, and to go out there and explore. I think, uh, I think there's also um, a survival component, even in the modern context, right? Like we know that uh, extinction level events can happen anytime we're overdue for a large statistical number of them. And we're only on one planet. and it's very fragile. It's the only place we know that can harbor life like us. And if we can at least get somewhere else, we could survive if one planet or some part of humanity got destroyed, um, we would have the ability to restart or to continue on. So. Yeah. So yeah, definitely special. It, it's inspiring, I think. Yeah. It's, it's inspiring. It's, it's definitely romanticized in, in different ways, but um, yeah. I, any way you put it, it's it's beautiful and it's uh, it's just telling of the, the the story of of humanity and how far we'll push things. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this: uh, I always find this a little bit interesting because everybody that I ask always comes with a different answer. So, if uh, there were some sort of colony on Mars and you had a t one way ticket to go, yay or nay? And if nay, why not? Victor, you should. I'll, I'll let Richard answer first. No, I, I nope, <laughs> nope. I beat you to it. I'm meeting my. Uh, <laughs> I I I don't know. Um, well, I I don't I don't think so. I I think looking at the the romanticized version of it, I I want to say yes. I want to say that that I I would. It would be so interesting to get that perspective. You know, one, um, I, I don't know if I'll ever be in space. I don't, I don't think that I will ever make it to space. But some this, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about the overview effect and you know the cosmic perspective. And I, I, that's one thing that I, I love hearing astronauts talk about. You know, looking at when they see the Earth from outside the Earth. That's uh, something that I think about a lot and I, I'm, I'm pretty positive that I, I'll never get there, but j even just the thought of it is, is amazing. And so the thought of being on Mars on another planet and seeing in that perspective is, is really, really interesting. But if I'm being 100% honest, I, I think the, the, the fear of the quality of life would kind of outweigh um, I think the rational part of my brain would kick in and, and tell me no. <laughs> yeah. Um, specifically because of the one way ticket part, I would say no, but I think because see, I want to go with all my bones, but I don't believe that it has to be that way. Even from the beginning, I think that we, um, you, you're in a field that makes reality the like you basically can can get us to places that we can't go right now like engineering rocketry science in general i think that has a great power to do like to take us to places right um i think that if you're going to become an astronaut in general you should accept the fact as i'm prepared to i believe that whenever you leave the earth no matter if it's staying in orbit or not, there's an inherent risk that you might not come home. I think that should be implicit in every mission, but um, I don't think it has to be one way. I think that like we should build to be able to come back and forth. It shouldn't just be go and stay and then what? It's gonna be isolated. They'll be on the frontier for sure. They'll be learning a lot. They'll be starting a new colony that will eventually build up. Um, but I don't think it has to be that way. How about you? Um, yeah, th those are really unique uh, perspectives. Um, I personally would say no. Um, you know, I know, Richard, you mentioned that your your goal is to be an astronaut, right? And uh, Victor, I don't think you've mentioned your goal, uh, or at least I, I haven't 
I'm not I'm not aware of what it is, but uh, if you'd like to mention it, by all means, feel free to. But to be honest, I have no idea, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, I have no idea what I'm doing, so it's okay. Yeah. I, I I'm all right there with you. <laughs> um, but for me, you know, my goal is to be a flight director, and I personally like to sort of take care of the crew from the ground. So for, for that reason is one of the main reasons why I wouldn't want to go along with an, uh, a plethora of other reasons, personal reasons, I would say, but, uh, just career wise, I would, I would take a hard pass on that. Let, let, let me ask you this because this aligns and now that I, I mean, I knew that cause I read what you sent. Um, which I'm, I'm sure Gene Kranz is, must be a household name for you because, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what if like, for instance, you were selected to be flight director for a Mars mission, but they said you're on the second component where you have to communicate with them from let's say gateway or like the moon to Mars. And for some reason, you as flight director for the duration of that mission have to be on gateway or have to be on the moon. Would you, would you do that? Wow. That's a really, really interesting scenario. I've never thought of that. Um, in that sense, I would take it in that sense. I would definitely take it. Um, cause that would be the opportunity of a lifetime, I think. And a lot um, closer than Mars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Right. Um, it's funny you mentioned Gene Krantz uh, before the pandemic hit. So I live really close to Johnson Space Center. Uh, I live about maybe 15 minutes away. And there's only, well, no, I guess I can't really say that. Well, what I wanted to say is I saw Gene Krantz the other day at HEB. And uh, yeah, he was just pushing his cart just like everybody else. And I walked past him and I swear like, I followed him with my, with my head. Right. And, uh, I looked over at my girlfriend. I was like, is that Gene Krantz? And then he looks over at me and just goes, and then, <laughs> and then keeps going. Oh, wow. Yeah. I saw him at HEB and like, I, so I had never, I had never seen him because obviously I've seen him in pictures. Right. And then we've all seen, well, I would hope we've all seen Apollo 13, right? And, uh, you know, he still has the same haircut. He still has the same haircut. I'm, I'm honestly he, surprised he doesn't wear the, the white uh, <laughs> vest all the time. But He knows what's up. Yeah. Like, talk about a, a real cool dude. And rumor has it, um, so... I mentioned I work at MCC, right? Mission Control. Um, but we work in like this, where, where, the, where the flight controllers sit, they sit on like floor number two and we sit on the ground floor. But Houston is weird to where the ground floor is different where you enter MCC from. So sometimes level two is a ground floor on one side of the, the building. And then level two is actually level two from where I enter the building from. So we're kind of like in the corner, right? We're the we're the, the shunned group, so to speak. And, uh, but yeah, rumor has it, he walks around MCC all the time and everybody has a picture. Anybody who's anybody has a picture with, with Gene. So that's like goals. a rite of passage. Yeah. <laughs> Did you think of asking him for a picture at HUB? To be honest, like I was just processing the fact that this <laughs> legend was in my presence. Or I, no, I was in his presence. Correction, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. <laughs> I, I totally would have, though, because wow. I'm that type of person. I love how he, he just kept going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. He's such a cool I dude. I know, about. right? <laughs> and, and that, you, know, you know, I mentioned earlier, like, these guys are like literal rock stars to me. And so this guy is, is, is another one of them. And then I guess this is another story while we're on the subject. So I've, I've had casual encounters with astronauts before to the point that I didn't even know they were astronauts. So I, I told Victor this story the other day. Um, 
we were we were having dinner and and um i started telling him about uh this astronaut that i came across on twitter um so i follow there's this one flight director who like he is my ideal person like i would love to be my version of him if that makes any sense um so every flight director gets a call sign and his call sign is tungsten flight and so the reason why and you get to choose your own uh call sign it's not like you know when you're in the military you do something dumb you get that nickname forever right <laughs> it's not like that um so yeah so i remember I, I was sitting in the room with with him and his name is royce renfrew and um I was sitting in a room with him uh, and he, I, this was when I had first started. I, I had no idea who he was or, or what he had done. And uh, one of my coworkers goes, do you know who that is? And I said, no, he started telling me about him. And then I, I went up and I talked to him and later in, in the meeting, he's, so this was a meeting with flight controllers and the MER, right? And he said, do you guys know why I chose the name tungsten flight? And I just kind of like shook my head. No, obviously he wasn't talking to me. Right. Um, but he said tungsten by itself is a strong metal, but tungsten infused with other metals is the strongest metal. Therefore I am nothing without you. And he was talking to his flight control team. And I was like, that's wow, like that is, that's great. Like that should go on in a book. Like that should be quoted all the time, you know? And uh, that, that showed like the level of leader he is, you know? And he commands, he commands respect anywhere he goes, I think. And that's like a really uh, uh, interesting quality about him. Um, but anyways, uh, that was another Tangent. Uh, yeah. So I, I came across this astro dinner, uh, Victor and I were having dinner and, and, uh, in Brownsville one day and, uh, I came across this one astronaut on Twitter and his name was TJ Creamer and all the astronauts on Twitter, like the beginning of their handles, like Astro, whatever their name is. Right. And so, uh, to steal that, I, I put that as my handle as well. Um, I don't know. So I, think I came Richard across that too, right? I have a variant, yeah. I put. I, I guess I prematurely put astronaut. Nice. I'm I'm putting myself to it. <laughs> there you go. Speaking it into existence. It's just yeah. Happen. There you go. Yeah. yeah, and so I I was in the room one day with with TJ Creamer is now a flight director, but I had no idea he was an astronaut. And I was also in the room with um, an astronaut. She is now an Artemis astronaut, and I'm really, really excited, and I hope she's the first woman on the surface of the moon. Uh, her name is Stephanie Wilson. And I remember this was one of the battery EVAs that we were getting ready to, to get going. I think it was the last meeting we had before the, the big day. And uh, she was in the room, and she was, she was manning Capcom. So she was the capsule communicator talking to the crew. So if you guys didn't know, the flight director does not interact with the crew at, at all whatsoever. So it's only one console and they're called Capcom and they communicate with the crew. And so the flight director has the final seal of approval on everything, right? So if they have any issues, you know, like, like tungsten flight said, he'll go with whatever his crew or whatever his flight control team instructs. So if there's something wrong with the suit, that goes to the EVA console. There's something wrong with the electrical system. That's Spartan, right? Um, and yeah, just I don't know, man. The uh, the astronauts they're so they're so humble about everything, and but at the same time they're so confident, and that's a really unique balance to have. And uh, I didn't even know who they were at the time. That's how I guess humble they were. But just by them speaking, you knew that, you know. Not that something was up, but that they were definitely special people. And so I ended up Googling them. And yeah, Stephanie Wilson was part of the, the, the shuttle crew that took Node 2 up to station. So really cool. 
Like just hearing them speak, you know, they had Astro in front of their Twitter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about goals. Oh my God. Like yeah. seriously. Yeah. And, and if you guys uh, are ever in Houston, I guess once the pandemic is over and we can kind of go back to whatever normal was, um, uh, JSC offers its employees to give tours to their friends and family. So uh, they're kind of behind the scenes tours. Um, so we get to go into like mission control and we get to see the flight control room um, and stuff like that. And so if you guys are ever up to it and for anyone who's listening, um, I love to do these tours. Um, I, I would not that I would make it my job, but I would definitely do it as like a side thing. Um, but for free, like I love it that much. It's, it's just so fun. Um, and every time I do it, I learn things too. So if you guys are ever up to it, uh, feel free to let me know. I'll we'll, yes we can schedule when. something. <laughs> yes. And when that's awesome. We're yeah. renting a stars bus and just taking a load of people. over. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, I, I do have to preface, I guess that, uh, I should have, um, there's a limit of 10 per employee, 10, 10 people per employee. So I can only take 10 people times. So the first 10 people to share this video now. <laughs> <laughs> so does this uh, include uh, shaking astronaut suit hand? Um, probably not. So at, with my previous role, I didn't have anything to do with the mock-ups. So I was never really allowed on the floor of Building 9, only on like special occasions, right? Um, that time when I got to shake the astronaut suit's hand, um, it was an open house of some sort. I don't remember why we were there. Um, I think it was like a Halloween thing. They were having like a Halloween at JSC or something. All this pre COVID of course. Right. Um, yeah, but my new role, because we do a lot more things with imagery and all of the buildings on site and building, building nine is a area that needs critical uh imagery i might have future access to that once we return i'm not too sure yet so i can't promise anything but either way we'll still go up in the catwalk and look down yeah. and everything awesome yeah absolutely so we talked a little bit uh, briefly just here and there through the whole episode about the uh, the Artemis Orion Gateway program. Uh, but uh, Alex, you, you told me recently that um, you were going to be playing a, a bigger role in the, or those um, missions. Uh, you, you were going to, you, your focus was going to be a little bit more on those now. Uh, so can we talk about that? Sure, yeah. Um, so from my perspective, um, I am focusing now with this new role in what they call imagery and multimedia. So anything uh, related with uh, cameras and camcorders. And so that being still imagery as well as uh, moving imagery, which is video um, and all the audio that comes with the video as well. And so um, my new role isn't, isn't necessarily mission related as it was before in terms of operations, um, but it's defining, you know, key requirements to what is, you know, what we require to ensure mission success when it comes to video, audio, and photos, right? So similar to the Apollo program, um, you know, we needed to take pictures on the moon, on the way to the moon, orbiting the moon, all that stuff, right? And so all of that, everything that comes with that in terms of, you know, the actual acquisition of that um, with included the downlinking of that and then the managing of that media uh, is something that I am now transitioning to. So that's as close as I've gotten it to it. And I know that sounds like a lot of like really uh, formal talk, right? It's, um, problem, problem is, is I can't really tell you what I can and can't do is because I'm still so new that I don't really know how far we're going to take it, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So I've only been in the job going on three months. This is, I'm in the middle of my second month. 
And so, you know, it, there's a lot to, to take in and, and digest and all that stuff. So I'm still learning and I'm still getting up to speed. But as far as I understand it at the moment, it's more just uh, identifying what um, the crew requirements are going to be, the vehicle requirements are going to be in terms of video and photos and everything that comes with it. So, And like that goes along with um, like, I don't want to say secondary objectives, but like, okay, the primary objective is to go to the moon again, but like there's also other objectives too to be there, right? There's science and there's, um, there's construction and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. So the funny thing about video, right, is like, it's, it's considered like a nice to have, it's not a, it's not a need. And so um, it's, it's a whole nother world from what I'm used to because electricity is a need. And so we've always been put like at the forefront, like, what do we need? Temperature, electricity, and pressure, right? Those are like the key things. And now I'm over here kind of just like, it's a nice to have. So if we still have some stuff left, we'll, we'll let you have it. But, but let the big boys talk. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, you got to step into it and then you'll get more and more responsibility. But I, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's been, it's been a pleasure so far. I mean, I think now, um, so my role is strictly human space flight. And so that's something that I really am passionate about. And now I get to work uh, closer to the astronauts. So we get to have conferences with the crew before they go up. And I have been a part of these recently, but, uh, you know, it, it's going to be definitely something different and cutting edge when it comes to the Orion program and Gateway and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really excited. Could you talk a little <laughs> bit about Gateway? Um, like, cause you mentioned that I think a couple of times, like for those who might not know what that is, what is that? And how does that relate to Artemis? That's a great question. Uh, yeah. So gateway is going to be the, the lunar outpost, so to speak, um, for the Artemis program. So what that really means is there's going to be a station orbiting the moon, similarly to how there is a station orbiting the earth. And the gateway will allow the astronauts to do way more things that they weren't able to do during the Apollo program. So in the Apollo program, you know, they only had what they took with them in terms of resources. So fuel, oxygen, electricity, that uh, obviously there's some that they could generate, but not to the extent that's probably required. And so with Gateway, it opens up, you know, immense capabilities to where once Gateway is complete, there's an opportunity to study the moon from an orbital perspective and to perform science that'll help us get to Mars and beyond, um, as well as having the capability of the boots on the ground to be able to do different types of science. So it allows for sort of a staging portion to where the crew can launch from earth either dock to the gateway and either refuel or you know whatever they need to do to get everything they need to um you know undock and land on the moon as well as return to the gateway and then return to earth so sort of kind of what we talked about richard earlier how it's not it's not a one-way thing right yeah um not even a two-way thing either anymore. Uh, it's it's definitely going to increase our human presence uh, within. I mean, the moon is is right there, but it's not just right there. It's an immense challenge, and it's going to definitely push humanity into a place we've been before. So it's familiar in that sense, but it's something totally, totally brand new and. Uh, it's going to be really, really, really cool that we are all going to be a part of it, right? We mentioned earlier that there's folks that we know that have seen the moon landings, right? I think it was the excerpt uh, Scott Kelly mentioned. He saw the, the gray video of seeing the moon landings. Like, who did that inspire? And so we're on the cusp 
of inspiring the next generation of explorers, scientists, engineers, mathematicians. Uh, the the STEM field is is going to grow significantly for that, and because of the Artemis program, and it's just it's another stepping stone as to the testimony of what humanity is capable of. And so I'm, I'm really, really excited for, for both aspects of it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I've, I I've rambled on a little bit. No, that's no, no. Awesome. It's, it's, yeah, it, it, it really is awesome. There, there is a lot there because, um, yeah, I have seen, uh, uh, I guess some, some people saying that, you know, we've already been to the movie. We did it. 50 years ago, why are we going back? Why can't we, you know, do something else? Uh, but you're right, it's like we're doing something completely different. Um, we, uh, I, I'm thinking of that, I think it was a Carl Sagan quote also, we, you know, about the, the cosmic ocean. And like, we've waited a little bit, gone like ankle deep, but now we're like, we're going out there and really exploring. And, you know, back in 1969 and, and the, the Apollo program, we, tested the waters and now it's like okay we know what we're dealing with let's build another space station around the moon like we're we're, do, we're it's not the same thing it's, it, we're really doing some revolutionary things now i wonder um if it'll be possible how how visible gateway will be probably not to the naked eye but if you have maybe strong binoculars or a telescope would you be able to see gateway going around the moon um, have you heard anybody conversations about that even? I haven't heard anything uh, to that effect, but that's a really, uh, that's a really good uh, point, you know, because when you look at the moon through a telescope, it, it's massive. And depending on how powerful your scope is, I feel like you can get a really granular level mm -hmm. of uh, clarity, right? With what you see. And I don't think, Gateway will be as big as ISS, right? Because ISS, I think, spans uh, an entire football field in terms of its uh, port and starboard direction. Um, so I don't think it's going to be that big, but I definitely think we should be able to to see something at right. some point. And so that's, that's really special. I never thought of it that way, but can you imagine just looking out and just being like, hey, look. Well, that's, that was my thought. And then as you were speaking, I also thought like, because the ISS passes in front of the moon sometimes. So you will get times where Gateway and ISS are like kind of almost in line. They're occulting each other. That would be a really awesome shot if somebody could take a picture of like the two space stations eclipsing the moon at the same time. That would be very, very special. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was going to say that because I, I know a lot of astrophotographers like doing that, waiting for the, the space station to go uh, to get in front of the moon, like a full moon, and that's a really good image. So uh, if you can see Gateway through a, a telescope, that'll happen a lot more often. <laughs> yeah. Although now that I think about it, you know, ISS in front of the moon is very small. Yeah. And it's only 250 miles up. That's true. right. It, it wouldn't be visible, certainly not visible, the gateway uh, visible to the naked eye. Um, yeah, I, th I think I saw something like ISS gets at like magnitude minus four on the sky, which is the third brightest object technically in the sky, right? Like moon and sun. But, you know, um, it's like as bright as Venus when Venus is if Venus was right overhead. Um, but yeah, gateway is probably it's probably like looking at like a, a fly in headlights because the moon is so bright, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you've ever looked at a moon through, looked at the moon, <laughs> looked at a moon, just any moon. Now look at a moon through the telescope. It's so funny because when it's like a full moon, your eyes hurt. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, big time. Like it's so beautiful, but <clears throat> ouch. <laughs> like the only way at um, at CTMO, at the, at the observatory, we could take a picture of the moon is if you have a type of filter in front of the camera that only lets like 1% of the total light in. And then through that 1%, you take a hundredth of a second of a, an exposure. And only then is it not saturated enough where you could see the moon. So it's like, wow. you need to take such a small sliver of light just to get it. But that's also a 17 inch telescope. So there's a lot of light coming in. Yeah. Yeah, I've, so I have a, my girlfriend actually bought me a, a telescope for my birthday. 
if it wasn't last year, it was a year before. And uh, it's a really, really cool telescope. You're, we're able to see, you know, uh, a lot of the, the planets. So Jupiter is my favorite one. And then Saturn is actually really clear as well. Um, but yeah, we look, we look at the moon sometimes and I've read that you can get some lunar filters because as you mentioned, when I look at it too long, it just really, really hurts. <laughs> it's like almost looking at the sun. It is. Yeah. It is. Um, something else you should definitely look at through your telescope is Andromeda. If you haven't already, you should definitely do yourself a service and do that. Cause that's, that's even bigger than the full moon in the sky. We just really? don't see it. Yeah, it's actually, so it's the farthest object you can see with your naked eye, period, in existence. It's the farthest object you could see. Um, but it's bigger than the full moon. It's just, wow. like, it's diffuse, but you could see it. And if you point your telescope at it, it's like, oh yeah, there's a galaxy. That's a giant galaxy in the sky. Wow, okay. <laughs> I'll definitely check that out. So I've always wanted to look at uh, galaxies and even like nebulas and stuff like that, but I've always heard that due to the, and obviously I've never tested this theory, but uh, due to the light pollution, it's difficult to, to really see it. And so living out here in Houston, where there's a oh, lot of light pollution, yeah. For sure. Um, the other thing is like, if you're using just like eyepieces, like you're just looking through it, um, it's not gonna be a spectacular, even if you took a one second picture with the camera, you're gonna see a lot more structure come out. But it, I think a lot of, people might be underwhelmed by like seeing some distant sky objects through just like a simple eyepiece because yeah, it's uh, the, you need to integrate the light a lot longer in order to see the interesting stuff. Yeah. So it's the, the blending of the two, right? The technology as well as the telescope, right? The, yeah, I guess like the way you capture the image. Think, think of it as like you're collecting, how do you collect the most amount of, raindrops is like you want your the biggest barrel and you want to hold it outside as long as possible and the only two ways to do that is bigger and bigger telescope uh in terms of aperture and uh take actual exposures rather than just looking through the eye so gotcha yeah, yeah. yeah. that makes a lot of sense i think the, the new iphones take exposure images it's kind of weird <laughs> It doesn't automatically so if the room's too dark it's like okay three second exposure <laughs> yeah that night mode is pretty legit yeah it's, it's magic to be honest like to for me because you know i'm i mean as as doing observations there's so many in like variables that you have to like mitigate when you're trying to take a picture and measure it and uh you see these iphone cameras that can like do all these automatic adjustments behind the scenes and i think i i I don't know how many people actually appreciate just how much that takes to do. Uh, it's incredible. The CCD camera technology has been basically everybody can just take amazing quality photos just whenever they want with their hands. So it's, yeah. it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, uh, one, one of these previous black Fridays, maybe it was two years ago. Now I bought a, a Sony camera. Mm -hmm. It was a a seven, two maybe and uh at the same time like i would take pictures of what i would take pictures of with the camera and then my iphone and obviously the when you zoom in on the camera it's like world's difference but when you post it on facebook or something facebook like compresses everything mm -hmm. so the quality almost seems identical Oh. And so it's a little, it's a little strange and it's a little sad because I was hoping to really use that camera, but I have my phone on me all the time. Right. I don't always have my camera. Right. What kind of, um, what kind of video specs are you talking about when you're dealing with the Artemis mission? Like, um, like what kind of camera or, you know, can, do, do, is that even planned out to a certain level of detail at this point? Yeah. So NASA does have contracts with uh, certain manufacturers of cameras. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say who. Uh, of course, of course. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so we, we do have basically a lot of the things we're flying on station right now is going to be a lot of the things that we're going to fly on Artemis. So hmm. it's, it's a lot of rehashing of, you know, old requirements and stuff like that, just because, you know, station's been up for so long that that's why we're, we always say like, we're doing all these things to learn. 
And so we've learned what cameras work and what don't. And so there's quite a few cameras on orbit right now that have a lot of dead pixels. I don't know if you've seen some of the pictures. Um, there's actually this really, really cool flight controller that I follow. Um, I think his name is Christopher White on Twitter. He's a Cronus flight controller. And uh, Cronus is in charge of um, that, among a, a bunch of other things that I'm probably going to miss. Um, is they're called MDMs, which is multiplexer, demultiplexer, which is basically computers on station, as well as station cameras. And so on his shift, he'll literally just like take pictures of stuff and then he'll post it on his Twitter. It's really cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know I was... we were allowed to do that, but. <laughs> well, he's, he's pushing boundaries like you, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, social, social media is crazy. Um, here at SpaceX, uh, at least at the one here, I'm sure it's at all the facilities too, but I've heard that people will, that um, they, they have apparently a team of people that are like dedicated to finding, because uh, you know, all the proprietary information is super valuable. And so if they find uh, things on social media posted by employees that aren't supposed to be there, they get addressed in like in a crazy amount of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that like when people disappear? Like the Russians? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually saw this one. I think it was a Snapchat video of somebody going up the, it was a high bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, man, that's like, that's like in there, in there. And they went all the way to the very top. I think they're like building some sort of structure up top. You're saying something somebody up has, there. That, that's like, oh my God. Yeah. Can yeah. you imagine? No, they are. No, they, they, it, well, you know, it was a Elon tweet because he's the only one allowed to <laughs> say what they're doing. But he, he mentioned they built the high bay where they're, where they're going to build the, the super heavy booster. And he said that the plan is to build a, a 360 bar on the top and they wanted to call it star bar or something. He turns memes into reality. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great, though. I, I, I love it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think he said recently because um, you know, he, he there was a big hype around Dodge, Dogecoin, and, uh, and and the hashtag Dogecoin to the moon was uh, started happening because I mean, it was figuratively because uh, the the stock for Dogecoin they were just trying to raise that, um, and then he said that they're going to put a literal Dogecoin on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, we're going to put a physical jo Dogecoin on the moon. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> that's what aliens are gonna find a million years from now. Just that, just this, right? Like, they're gonna be like, "This is the this we clearly we we thought we were the superior beings in the universe, but these beings they 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 were the peak." <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah what what would what would happen if like for instance um, humans get to Mars and they start digging and suddenly they like hit something hard and they find it like a, a the tip of a pyramid or something with like weird with weird hieroglyphics on it let's say that we've never seen before like what what is the protocol there what do we do then yeah so i'm not too sure because i've actually thought of that before and uh so i the thing i can speak to is uh certain types of video and pictures come down as restricted and unrestricted so for example you know earth views from from the space station that comes down unrestricted everybody can see that right but for example and this is just like a like a literal thing right uh the the crew members all have to exercise like two hours a day so they sometimes they have cameras pointed at them and if there's like a video of them or a picture of them they can decide whether that's restricted or unrestricted right and so most of the time it's just restricted so i would think that if there was ever anything like that, it would be super hush hush, you know, uh, lock the doors, sort of speak, shut everything down and restrict that. And only a certain pair of eyes can see. Can well, see. I, I know it's like a five year time frame, but I mean, is the, the goal of, of perseverance, one of the main goals is to bring back soil samples and test them for signs of, of ancient microbial life. And so, it's going to take a few years to get the samples back. I think it was 2026 uh, for them to test them here at the Earth Labs, but that, that's 
been thinking about that too. Like that's going to be, if they do find something, that's going to be, you know, it's going to be scary <laughs> to like, who knows what's going to happen. I mean, who knows what the state of the exploration in general is going to be in five years, but no matter what, like that's going to be a crazy thing to, to announce if, if they find something. Yeah. Because then, yeah, because then we don't know. There could be pyramids under there. There could be. Hey, look, don't don't look at me. It's uh, Mars <laughs> stopped becoming habitable when Earth started becoming habitable. Uh, and there's no uh, there's not enough evidence to distinguish whether or not that was a coincidence. Yeah, that's just a fact. Um, I would also hope that they test like if they found like, let's say, bacteria in like stasis, like on Mars in soil that before they bring any of that back into Earth's atmosphere that they tested enough there because like you're essentially bringing foreign a foreign entity into Earth's atmosphere who knows and like I hope a lot of people learn from the pandemic that like we got off not to say that this was like a good thing but imagine imagine something as communicable as the coronavirus but it's from Mars where our biology has never um, interacted with it before, um, so I would I would hope that that's tested enough there first before it's brought back here. Yeah, that's interesting. That's kind of like the the two week quarantine that they would put the lunar astronauts in when they would return, right? Because right. mm. you know that it's ca- kind of crazy to think like when we first went to the moon, we just simply did not know if there was stuff on the surface. Like we don't know, and who knows if they're bringing stuff back with them. Yeah. So, okay, I, I have something I, want, I wanted to bring up, too, because this is it's something similar um, to, you know, bringing bacteria back from places is this idea of um, panspermia, right? And one thing I, I, I saw when I was reading up on the International Space Station was all the biology tests that have happened on it. And um, I have this fascination with, like, things that can survive, like, you know, extremophiles and things that can survive really exotic and hard conditions and tardigrades going into this like ultra dry state where they almost fill their cells with this like these crystal beads they 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 pretty much just dry themselves out and crystallize and uh-huh. so we people apparently put them on the outside of the the space station and then like a week later they were still alive like yeah, yeah. just exposed to hard vacuum so yeah so they they have a lot of science experiments like that so there's actually a platform on the Japanese module. Um, it goes by a lot of names, but I know it as the Kibo module. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's this exposed platform on there where they have a bunch of different payloads that and science that just uh, they expose to the extreme temperatures uh, shifts as well as the vacuum of space. And so, yeah, I I, I haven't heard of that experiment specifically, but uh, yeah, it, I mean, stuff like that fascinates me as well. I think it's it's very very interesting, and um, like it's one of those things that just boggles the mind. Like, why, why, how is that even possible? Type of deal, you know? Yeah, especially because like there's not many places on Earth where I feel I feel like natural selection would not have figured that out. Like, why would something have to be able to survive hard vacuum? Yet something that's pretty much everywhere on the Earth can. Right. Um, yeah, that blows my mind. The other thing is, like, um, we know that interplanetary seeding, at least in the solar system, is quite common. So, like, Mars and Earth exchanges material all the time throughout their history. So, like, why wouldn't there have been perhaps something transferred to and from? So, that's a good point. And that kind of that kind of attests to you know bringing the soil samples back. If if Mars and Earth transfer material all the time, if something bad would have happened. Don't you think it should have happened already? Could have been. Yeah, especially because, you know, that's a good point. Um, if we're preserving samples, then we're pretty much doing a better job than it just randomly flying through space and then entering the Earth's atmosphere. So um, there could be a preventative measure where we're actually saving that life on the journey. Maybe the journey, it, it, there's so many hazards, right? It's exposed to high levels of radiation, et cetera, but, and it burns up in the atmosphere. But there, you know, I worked for a semester as an undergraduate with um, a planetary astronomer who studied asteroid impacts. Uh And she showed me calculations of how to like, basically 
how big of an asteroid, like there's a range of asteroid sizes where it's not too small. If you put a bacterium in the center, it would completely be destroyed. And it's not too big where when it, it blows up the, I mean, it never leaves, but you know, it, you're rare to find a giant asteroid of that size. There's a range where it would survive and be able to actually get out of the asteroid. So, um, yeah, uh, I guess I guess we really just have to be careful when we do find life somewhere. I really hope that our that we're careful with how we interact with it. Definitely. Have you guys seen that movie? I think it's called Life, where they find some sort of sample and they're on some sort of space station. I think Ryan Reynolds comes out in it. I haven't seen it. And uh, it ends up being like this like flesh eating thing, and they're doing like a an experiment in one of the the glove boxes, right? It's a mm-hmm. box, a clear box with the gloves. And then it just like holds down the guy with the glove. That's like, that was oh, one of the, yeah. you know what I'm talking about, Victor. That was one of the trailers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, vaguely. Yeah, yeah. If I did watch it, it was a long time ago, but yeah. yeah. It's been a while. Uh, there's that one and there's, um, what's the, is it Europa Report? Where there's like these like octopus creatures that are underneath Europa. Oh, I've and never heard of that one. That one's good. I think it's Europa Report. And then there's, um, then of course there's Apollo 18, like moon crabs that live in the craters, which I guess is not out of the question, but I, I'm wondering what they would eat except each yeah. other. But you know, like. <laughs> you know what's really fascinating about Apollo 18? I, I just recently saw it, so it's super fresh. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. But the Russian lander. I had uh, never seen that. Oh, yeah. 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 So in that Sorry, movie, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in that movie, there's, uh, I guess it's the crew of Apollo 18 and the Apollo program ended with Apollo 17. So mm-hmm. Apollo 18, I guess, was the flight that never happened. And uh, in that movie, the astronauts are walking around the surface of the moon and they come across a Russian lander, which to our knowledge never happened, but you never know. And according to that movie, it, it all did happen. And then it's still consistent with, you know, history, right? Like yeah. all of the events that happened took, yeah. So, I, I mean, those types of things, like to be on the surface of the moon where I, you mentioned earlier, you're in the vacuum of space where the difference between shadow and, and day is 400 degrees. Um, you would need to be like a crab or something that has a very hard exoskeleton to protect against the extreme heat. And, also the uh, radiation right and probably something about expansion too because like when you go from hot to cold that extreme like solids change and so these things have to be really hardy creatures maybe giant tardigrades or something like that that's a good point yeah (laughs) i i got an email well well when we were when we took a break i i checked my email and and surprisingly it's uh the the sub is from nasa uh did you say like like, stop talking (laughs) (laughs) this is like i see you no but the the subject line is nasa invites you to join the spacex crew 2 mission um and there's another thing about uh robin gaddens gaddens am i saying that right um is that an astronaut no so let me read this real quick so i I got this email exciting times are coming soon our SpaceX Crew 2 mission will carry NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, along with uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut. I'm not going to do him a disservice by saying that wrong. Um, and ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet, who will serve as mission specialists. Liftoff of the Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket with astronauts is targeted for no earlier than 6.11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Thursday, April 22nd, from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And then a little lower, it says, congratulations, Robin Gaddens, or, or Gatons. Robin Gaddens has been named the director of the International Space Station at NASA headquarters. Gaddens has held the role in an acting capacity since August 2020 and brings an impressive 35 plus years of experience in both the space station program and in development of the life support systems for human spaceflight missions. So cool new updates that happened yeah. during the time of this. So that means you got invited to, to witness Dragon 
two, crew two. Right? Like Washington. Right. Yeah, because I, I know they, they hand out like tickets to see, to physically see the launch out of Cape. That would be cool. <laughs> oh, it does, yeah. It, it sent me to, there is a link that says crew two plus you. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, NASA. Um, and it does say NASA invites public to share excitement of agencies SpaceX Crew 2 mission. Uh, NASA invites the public to take part in virtual activities and events uh -huh. ahead of SpaceX's Crew 2 mission. Uh, yeah, I think it's virtual. I was going to say, oh, it's I'm okay. going to book a drive over there. <laughs> yeah. Members of the public can attend the launch virtually, receiving mission updates and opportunities normally reserved for on-site guests. NASA's virtual guest experience for Crew 2 includes curated launch resources, a behind-the-scenes look at the mission, notifications about NASA's social interactions, and the opportunity for a virtual launch passport stamp following a successful launch. That sounds That's awesome. exciting. That's really yeah. exciting. Yeah, it would be cool to go to the Cape, but um, <laughs> have you been to the Cape? No, I've, I've never seen a real life rocket launch and I'm a little sad to say it, but it's true. I, so I was in Brownsville once when SpaceX tested one of their vehicles, but I wasn't out uh, close to it. I just saw it out of my parents' front yard. So that's really cool. Um, but no, I've never been out to the Cape. Uh, I did get invited uh, similar to what you just got an invitation to for one of SpaceX's launches, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't make it that time, so. But yeah. Yeah, that's gonna have, have to be a goal of us to, to all go see one together. Definitely. Yeah, they're gonna happen pretty often here, so <laughs> yeah, just time it right and maybe it'll happen. Yeah. So, so Alex, what's, um, what are the next steps for Alex? What are you, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing now? What are you doing tomorrow? And what are you doing in the future? Um, so I definitely, I guess in terms of my education, I definitely plan to go back to school pretty soon here. Uh, I would like to get my master's degree in electrical engineering. Um, and career wise, I definitely think my, my, my current role is really interesting and due to the virtual, due to the pandemic, I've only worked virtual, so I haven't really gotten the full experience. And so I really want to see where it goes, where it takes me. I'm, I'm really new into it. And so I don't really know what to expect, but I'm really excited for the future. And I think only good things will come of it. Um, and yeah, I know, I guess speaking a little bit to my goals of becoming a flight director one day, I know NASA continuously hires uh, or puts out the job postings for flight directors as they just recently did that um, maybe in September of last year. Uh, I actually applied and I got an email saying that they were reviewing my resume and all my qualifications or whatever, but uh, obviously I wasn't selected, but it's okay because similar to the astronauts, um, they definitely prefer folks with more experience and I, I think I'm just a little too young for it at the moment. So just continue to, to diligently work and learn as much as I can. I think that's the big thing. Uh, every day that I learn something is a good day. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a great outlook. It's very similar to like, as you said, the astronauts, you just have to keep every time, even if you think like, Oh, I'm, I don't have the, I don't have the experience. Like I see that every time they have a call for astronauts, I fill out the application. Um, it's just, I think persistence is the key persistence and not giving up. You, you said at the very beginning, it's like getting tripping and falling over on your face and then getting back up. And that's, the, that's the most important part is getting, as long as you're getting back up, doesn't matter how many times you fall over. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you bring up a good point and this is, I guess for me, it's a little, it's sharing a little bit more than I typically would. But so with SpaceX being in our backyard, I would love to one day work there. And I've actually applied 
numerous times and they always come back with no. Um, and so for anyone out there who's done the same thing or wants to work at SpaceX or anywhere for that matter, it doesn't matter where, um, you know, Richard, you mentioned that persistence is key. And I, I definitely think that's true. Um, statistics will tell you that out of 100 applications, out of 100, out of 100 applications, 99 of them could be no, but it only takes one yes to change your life. Yep. So keep, keep at it. And because I know I will, and I think everybody else should, and don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to, you missed 100% of the shots you don't take. <laughs> like Michael Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott. Wayne Gretzky, <laughs> Michael Scott. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the reason I bring that up is because I, I have a few friends who, like, re are really unhappy with their jobs that not in this area, but in some, some of my friends that I went to school with. And they get real discouraged when they receive no's from employers and stuff. But if I could only pull up my email and show you guys how many times SpaceX has told me no, and I still apply all the time. Um, you know, I think, I think it's on the order of 50 at least now. So <laughs> halfway there. <laughs> halfway. <laughs> you're, you're, you're 50 more ahead of many people. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it's all about, uh, sorry. I know we keep adding on to this. There's just so much <laughs> substance to this conversation. It's so great. But, uh, I mean, to tie things kind of together, you, you don't know how far you can go until you, push the, the boundaries, uh, you know, you, you have a picture of you touching the crate and shaking hands with the astronaut suit and because you pushed the boundaries and that's kind of the lesson you got to take everywhere. You, you just, you don't know how far you can go until you try. Exactly. And on, on the very best day, you'll surprise yourself. Yeah, that's actually, wow. That's so profound. That's actually really profound to be that that really resonated with me. Um, maybe even hopefully on the bad days, you'll surprise yourself too. Absolutely. With the right mindset. Well, I think, I think, I don't think we could top that to be honest. So, <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll say this, that, um, so that ladies and gentlemen and children of all the planet earth and the surrounding universe, um, these, our receding horizons.